What's up my fellow poker enthusiasts, it's Renee aka The Wacko here and together with my co-host Adam Carmichael we present to you the Mechanics of Poker podcast. In this podcast we deconstruct high stakes poker players, figuring out what it is about them, how they think, what they do that makes them so successful with an extra focus on the obstacles they faced and the skills they had to develop to surpass them. Over the years, me and Adam have gained a lot of experience in both reaching high stakes poker ourselves and teaching other players to do the same. We have bundled all this knowledge together in our coaching program, The Mechanics of Poker, which is the most complete poker coaching product on the market. If you want to have a chance to work with me and Adam so you can get unstuck and make more progress in your poker career, go over to mechanicsofpoker.com to apply. But without further ado, let's learn from another high stakes player's journey in today's episode. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Mechanics of Poker podcast. Very excited to chat with today's guest. But before we start, I wanted to quickly thank everyone who applied to our Mechanics of Poker coaching program. We only had 10 spots available, so unfortunately, I know many of you missed out. But make sure to keep on following the channel, sign up to our email list so you get notified next time we reopen, all right? In today's episode, we will have a chat with Dutch high-stakes MTT player Jans Arends better known as Graf Tackle Online. Jans has been playing MTTs for 13 years and his first significant boost was winning the famous Sunday Million on PokerStars for 200k. After that, it took him another five to six years to really reach the high stakes he plays now and profiting millions along the way, establishing himself as one of the best players on the internet. He recently also showed his skills away from the computer, winning 30k Triton event in Vietnam and getting second in the 15k, cashing for over 1.5 million dollars. Next to his impressive poker results, he also has a very impressive Twitter feed, so would highly recommend giving him a follow there. As always, we are joined by my co-host and co-mechanics of poker coach Adam. Adam, how are your Twitter skills? (laughs) <laughs> I don't tweet at the moment, so they're non-existent, but I have checked out John's Twitter and it's yeah, very funny, but also uh, yeah, very educational. He's got some good like uh, tweets around poker concepts, poker players, and yeah, very good. I mean, I'm looking forward to today's guest. I'm quite open in terms of where this conversation could lead. I'm quite intrigued about his early career win of the Sunday Million, how that shaped his career in a good way or a bad way. I think it could go uh, yeah either side there in terms of he could either end up playing too high or he could end up losing half his role. And then obviously he's had a very recent score on the Triton and yeah, basically trying to map out his storyline from that Sunday Million win to the Triton win and everything in between. So yeah, very looking forward to uh, getting the story together. Well, before we start, I would like to give a big shout out to the sponsor from our podcast, which is GTO Windsert. GTO Wizard has made studying poker accessible for everyone and is, in my opinion, one of the best places to go if you are serious about improving your poker game. Next to having access to all GTO solutions of every spot, MTTs, cash, doesn't really matter, spins, having the ability to upload your hands and let Wizard find it for leaks, you will also get access to weekly coaching webinars in which various coaches, including myself, educate you on the most important spots to start crushing the game. So go over to gtowizard.com slash mechanics. And to get you started, we will give you 10% off using the slash mechanics code. Okay, that's gtowizard.com slash mechanics. At the end of this podcast, we will have a giveaway where you can win one free membership to GTO Wizard. So make sure to stick around to the end. But for now, let's hop into our conversation with Jans, a.k.a. Graftekel. All right, Mr. Arends, there he is. Thank you for coming on the pod. Really looking forward to have this chat with you. Hello. Hello, guys. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. I think uh, a lot of the audience, especially the ones that are maybe not so focused online, maybe first started to hear a bit more of you recently because you recently uh, made quite a name for yourself in the live poker scene. Pinking, I think, the 30K and getting second in a 15K Triton event in Vietnam, if I'm correct. 
Yep, that's correct. So how was that trip for you? Well, I mean, uh, obviously very good. Um, yeah, I mean, like live poker in general or like historically has not been very good for me. Uh, not that I played that much, but definitely went to my fair share of uh, EPT stops, for example. And I never really seemed to do that well, like especially compared to online. Um, and I think therefore I also never really enjoyed it that much. And then I saw the, the tried stops, um, the earlier ones, and it always looked like it was very, uh, a lot of fun, like a good mix of like, you know, high stakes racks and then uh, a bunch of amateurs. So like really fun fields to play. Also, everything seemed like super well organized. I mean, the higher the buy-in is usually the more uh, enjoyable the experience in my, uh, in my experience anyway. And so I, I was like, okay, I have to go to one of these stops. And then Vietnam came up and I was like, okay, I mean, I live in, uh, in Vienna now. I can do it tax-wise compared to uh, the Netherlands where I lived earlier. Um, never been to Vietnam. So this seems like the stop to go to. And uh, yeah, I mean, I ended up going and obviously, I mean, that being basically the first two tournaments I played uh, essentially. So it's, it, yeah, it was a, it was a dream uh, stop in terms of live poker. Yeah. When you, when you mentioned that in previous live stop, maybe you didn't really get the, the success that you wanted. You also didn't play much. So obviously variance is going to play a big factor. Did you maybe also see maybe other stops more as like a holiday slash poker playing? And this one was maybe more like, okay, I'm actually here to play poker. Yeah, yeah, you could definitely say that actually. Uh, I mean, EPTs, uh, especially the the later ones that are played. So let's say the more recent in, in more recent years, it was also very much social event kind of thing. So because you know, as a poker player, you you're, you live in isolation at least to some extent, right? You you work at home, um, you you do the all the playing uh, by yourself. So live poker is nice in that way that you get to meet your uh, your peers, and uh, yeah, in that way it was mostly also social. And yeah, the stops that I go to, like Barcelona, Prague, these kind of cities, that's the stops that I like to go to. And obviously, yeah, these are nice cities as well. There's a lot of stuff to do. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say like in terms of um, approaching it from a professional standpoint, the, uh, the Trident stop was, was, was different for sure, yeah. So you, you now know the secret formula going forward? Well, the secret formula is just winning a lot of flips, to be honest. I mean, like you said, like the, the, the sample you play in live book is so tiny compared to online. It's it's very, very hard to to actually, uh, you know, like get the variance out of the sample. I mean, it's impossible, basically, right? So you're always going to be um, going to gonna be a victim of the of the variance in some way. And uh, yeah, you, you just got to hope to uh, to at some point uh, run good. And I mean, I did that now, but I, like the, the five years before that, let's say, I was definitely down in live poker. So yeah, it's, and it can swing around in like three days. So kind of uh, funny how that works. Get an idea for like some of the listeners, let's say, you know, an average week, how many tournaments do you play a week? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, like, let's say, I mean, it depends a little bit, of course, like if, if there's a online series going on. So let's say then, then I would play like five, six days a week. That would be a lot more tournaments than let's say my regular week where I would maybe play three days a week or two or three days a week, I guess um i don't know i'd say on average maybe yeah, it's a tough question uh maybe between like 75 and uh, during series like a lot more oh, that, that that that's a lot of live poker <laughs> yeah exactly i mean yeah that's like uh i mean that's the, the that sample i probably don't play in a year so yeah i mean this must especially for for guys that you know made the conscious or maybe semi-conscious decision to mainly focus on live poker Oh, it's, can, can, be, can be quite torture. I, I honestly, I have no idea how to do it. Uh, I, I, I've been thinking about this, especially after trying. I was like, how do these guys that, that barely play online, how do they do it? Like they go to, I mean, they, they do go to a lot of stops to be fair, but it, like they, they play such a tiny sample and, and it's so easy to just run like bottom 5% or something and just break everything basically, right? I mean, how do you keep going after that? It's just, I, I have no idea how to do it. Uh, I, I think it's impressive that some of, some of these guys, I mean, I saw one example, sorry, it's hard to call them out, but like for Triton specifically uh, in the app, you can look at everyone's results. And like, for example, Petrangelo is obviously like uh, a sicko. I think he bricked like 25 Triton tournaments in a row. He, he didn't have a single cash after playing like, I don't know how many stops. Like this is how brutal the variance can be so yeah it's it's it makes you think like and it's it's impressive that people keep going after such a streak 
Yeah, actually, it was funny that you mentioned because a friend of mine, he actually said exactly the same thing that you know. We talked about his life variance and then he he said exactly the same about per transfer, yeah. like ne never cashed. Yeah, because it's it's one of the it's one of the most extreme examples that I can think of. I, I I imagine like he played some other stuff in between that he did cash, but like if you just look at Trident, and, and Trident is probably softer than most of the other stuff that he plays. So it's even yeah, it's it's it has to be a bottom X percent of run. Uh and yeah, you can get that in tournaments easily. Someone has to get it, right? There's always yeah, like someone has to get it. But there's always a fear that like you always be, you you know consciously about you know the variants, but then there's always like this voice, yeah, okay, but not me, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I, and I, I think it's you. In, in tournaments, uh, everyone's always talking about the the guy that gets the top one percent run, right? These are the guys that are in, in the spotlights and that everyone talks about. But the one that is in the bottom one percent, like I mean, usually these people disappear. I think uh, when it happens online, there's there's some high six racks for sure that disappears, and I think sometimes this happens because they just Go on such a bad run, and not everyone can can go keep going through that. So, um, yeah. But in the it. comments, in the comments of this spot, I saw I think a couple of times the word survivor bias mentioned. Oh, and yeah. obviously, like throughout certain points in in your career, Adam's career, my career, I'm sure there were stretches where you know if it would have gone worse, or you would you would have run your bottom one percent, maybe you would have quit. You know, maybe maybe a little a little bit of heat came at the right moment that gave you enough motivation and like some external results to keep on going, and that therefore you actually made it to the long run. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think especially in the, in the beginning, uh, when you're not that familiar with variance yet, and I mean you don't have a big bankroll yet. Like if you hit a bad run in the start, I think there's many people who probably start playing poker and they get like a pretty bad run at the start. You just give up, right? Oh, okay. I mean, it's just, I'm not as good at, as, at this as I thought, or I mean, it's it's the game is harder than I thought. I don't know. Like there's many things you can think other than oh, I'm I'm bottom five percent run here or something, you know. So I think if I um. We'll get to that, I guess, when we talk through how I got started. But I, I got very lucky at, at the start. So definitely uh, one of the, the guys that is in the survivorship bias uh, group. But I try to be aware of that as well. Yeah, and, and obviously, you know, we, we like it's easy to say everyone at the top, survivorship bias, move on. Well, obviously, obviously, you know, that's, that, that's too easy. Like I also saw the bridge. So thank you for uh, bringing it back to the start of your career. Because, you know, from the outside, looking into these winners, it's often easy to say and forget like about all the years that went uh, before you actually putting yourself in a position where you could play a Triton event like that. For example, yeah. I think you played, you started playing poker around 15 years ago and like the poker boom, uh, playing in small home games and the school breaks. Uh, so you did actually mention you ran good in the beginning, but I was just in general curious what attracted you towards the game when you started playing? What made you come back for more? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, I remember that I was hooked from the start, basically. I, I mean, I've always been uh, into games, like just strategy games, board games, all this kind of uh, stuff. Um, and, and I guess I all, also always have had this like kind of obsessive nature uh, about this, uh, about games, for example. Like if I play a game, I'm, I, I really get into it and I really want to improve, uh, you know, try to try to beat the game or try to beat the people that, that are playing the game um so that was yeah like and especially in, in terms of poke like we we started playing like super recreational level level of course like school breaks penny stakes uh this kind of thing um but yeah the idea of trying to improve quicker than other people can improve and 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 especially if, if there's money involved like obviously um you know me and my family used to play quite a lot of games like board games for example and i i would just hate losing to the point where i would start crying after losing like this i was really i mean it was probably not a lot of fun to play, play these kind of games with me um and then when poker came around and, and money was involved as well i was like wow i mean i can i can try to get good at this game and actually you know win money and obviously at that point it was not about making a living from it but even making you know like 20 euros from it or something would be huge for me. And, and combining these two things is, I think, what really got me hooked pretty quickly. Uh, just the strategy side of it, trying to improve at a game, obsessive nature about it, and then the upside, which other games don't have, right? If you win a game, you feel good for half an hour or something, and then, you know, you move on. But with poker, that's the upside of actually making money from it. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the combination of these two things was, uh, yeah, I've gotten hooked immediately, I think. How soon did you realize that there was more to the game of poker than you know looking look looking to make a good hand to get the money in? When did you first like realize, hey, wait, there are certain strategies I can implement uh, that will actually change the outcome of the hand? And do you maybe recall like certain aha moment in the beginning, like oh, I remember in in a previous podcast 
uh, Lucky Chewy said, at some point I realized it was important to know how much money was actually in the pot. For example, that <laughs> I thought was a very interesting yeah. go break. I, I, like, don't, go I, don't, I don't specifically remember um, these kind of aha moments, but I mean, it, it probably took me longer than I would uh, like to admit, like uh, probably a few years, uh, because in the beginning you, you don't play that regularly. Um, and it's and it's still like very recreational level and, and back then there was also not like many very, uh, accessible poker content for pure amateur right um so i, I think i would read a, a little bit online um but not that much in the beginning and then after maybe one or two years i guess although i mean it's so long ago i, I feel very old talking about this but uh, it's so long ago that i and, and my memory is really not the greatest so um but i think it took me it took me quite quite some time before i really uh, figured out Okay, I, you know, you can actually, uh, you have a lot of resources to improve at this game. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, speaking of survivorship bias, like I um, I started out playing free rolls online. So I, I never, never uh, deposited any money. And um, I'm sure if you, you guys remember Everest Poker, I don't think it exists anymore, but uh, just us. The Shastas, exactly. Yeah, you used to have this one or two table sit and go free rolls where you can win five cents, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I I started exactly in the same way. Then you got five cent, and then you bring it to the what was it, zero point one, zero point two cent cash game tables, and try to spin it up. Exactly, exactly. Well, that's that's exactly what I did. I, I would I would like grind the shastas, maybe grind it up into fifty cents or one dollar or something, like endlessly playing these free rolls. And then uh, I remember very very vividly, like uh, I used to take these shots at the cash games. Then at some point, I think I had like one dollar, like was a big bankroll at the time for playing five five dollars or five cents uh, free rolls right so i go to the sketch game and i remember getting it in set over set i was i i got uh, over set it and uh, and i i picked one out of it. <laughs> and i remember thinking like uh many times after like i think if i would have not picked that one out i might have just given up <laughs> so i mean this is like the most extreme for, form of, of uh of survivorship bias you can basically come up with i'm not obviously not sure if i would have quit but I remember like being, uh, I would have been pretty devastated if I, if I didn't bring that one. And then I, I turned this like, I guess, whatever I took out of the game, a few dollars. Um, and I, I started playing cash initially. A lot of people don't notice, I think, but I, I used to be um, a 25 NL uh, regular on um, nice. uh, Betfair, of course, because <laughs> I moved from average to bad for, for at some point. And uh, but I, I was really a very shitty cash game player. I, I, I played too many tables. I, I think I had decent rate back, so I played kind of played for rate back. And I mean, I didn't really enjoy it that much. I was I was into poker, but I, I had to find my, my niche uh, still, so to speak. And then I think I played, randomly started playing some tournaments and I got very lucky uh, in the beginning. Uh, I remember that I, um, I think this was on Betfair as well. Uh, maybe it was like a I don't know, twenty twenty dollar buy-in tournament or something. Obviously, there was no bankroll management at this time, so this this is probably like half my bankroll or something. And uh, and and I I think that for I think six seven hundred uh, dollars. And I immediately after that I, I um, because my friends I think were uh, at a party or something, and I I went went to the town party and spent like half of that money immediately. <laughs> so um, yeah, bankroll management was uh, was definitely not something I was very good at at start. But then uh, then I got hooked. Uh, uh, by tournaments because i mean if you do well to start like tournaments are a lot of fun if you if you if you win like there's nothing i think for me at least in poker that compares to like going deep into a, in a tournament and uh yeah i, I kept playing tournament but still uh, still pretty recreationally i mean i wasn't uh, i was very bad still and um i was uh that, that was around the time that i finished high school i was still playing under my dad's name i, I guess i can say that because i don't play on that for anymore um so it was not it, it was you know kind of penny stakes and and um, and on the side kind of thing, uh, and then when I started studying and I moved out of my um, I moved moved out of my parents' place, um, yeah that, that's when I started playing a little bit more and uh, also kept playing tournaments, and uh, I was lucky enough to uh, very randomly bink uh, bink on a million, uh, and that's kind of uh, yeah my uh, my kickstart. That's actually a, a funny story. Um, I guess uh, yeah, this will be fun for people to hear. Uh, so this is like let's say the the I think the first year that I started studying, and it was pretty much right after I moved out. So living on my own was uh, also pretty new, and um, so it was on a Sunday. And I mean, the, in this period, like everyone would just party every single day. So a couple of my friends were uh, partying somewhere, and they uh, their route to their uh, their place uh, was um, like they, they they crossed my house basically, and so they they just randomly rang my doorbell at like 
I think 1 a.m. or something. Obviously, I was playing poker, so I was there. I opened the door. They just keep drinking in my room. Like, I mean, I think one of them left maybe it's like 5 a.m. The other one passed out on my bed, like behind me. I was still playing the Sun a million. And uh, at some point, uh, I mean, I think I was 300 and uh, we made a deal. And I wake up my friend. <laughs> Like, dude, and he was obviously like super hungover. Like, dude, I think I think I just uh, won 200k, and he's like, "What the fuck are you talking about? Like, what's going on here?" And then uh, and it was already like this is already like very very uh, back then the sun a million run until like nine or ten in the morning, I guess, or something. Uh, and then uh, and then I remember we, we walked together to the supermarket, got a crate of uh, of beer, and just started started drinking and celebrating. It was uh, yeah, it was pretty wild at the time. But I think in, the, in terms of aha moments, after that, I got like really this realization, like, okay, first of all, you can make a lot of money. Like, I mean, 200K and, and after taxes and um, and converting to euros, <laughs> I think maybe I was left with like 100K euros, maybe a little bit more. But obviously like as a student who was completely broke, that's an insane amount of money to to get. And I was, I really realized like, okay, I mean, I guess, you know, you can really do this for a lot of money. and. I think if I want to do that, then I should also tr put some effort into improving. So after that, I really started putting in a lot of hours uh, into improving, like trying to get better at the game way more consciously than I, I did before that. So in, in a funny way, like binking a tournament was what made me tr uh, wanting to improve, which is, I I'm not sure if that's the, the way it usually goes for people. Yeah, so. I would say it's usually the opposite, right? Then people. Yeah. So what made you realize that? You know, I, I guess a lot of people would interpret, hey, I want to send a million. Oh, wow. Apparently I'm great at poker. Let's, let's, you know, co continue. But you somehow realize like, oh, wait, there's a great potential. But you had a lot of self-awareness that you actually realize like, oh, I probably got quite lucky here as well. There's a lot of potential if I improve my game. Yeah. But it also, I think it also means that before that I had a complete lack of self-awareness. Like, I, I think before that I yeah it's it's weird I I think I was I think I thought I was like pretty decent but after that I it really made me realize like wow there's, there could be a lot of money in this game and and it kind of shifted my mindset from just playing a little bit and I guess kind of trying to get lucky or thinking you're doing well but not really doing well to like wait if this is this could be a career path you know like and I obviously also had like I mean not necessarily the resources in in the sense that I took on like an expensive coach or anything but like if you start out with a huge bankroll and in that time like 100k if you play average stake i don't even know what i played maybe like 20 dollars or something uh it's obviously such a huge bankroll that the, the risk of going broke is, is near zero if, you, if you're not a huge dejan so uh i think if you if you don't have that kind of backup uh, of, of a huge bankroll it's, it's a lot more difficult i think to keep to keep grinding maybe or have this peace of mind to uh to really go for it i guess that's interesting because I recall actually a story from uh, our fellow fellow Dutchman Joris, who was actually the first podcast guest that we had on. I think it's already yeah, so a little year little ago, too. and he actually yeah. also mentioned that you know it's like similar story. Then he binked the big tournament, but then usually what happens is people think they're way better than they are, and they give away like half of it to a sort of higher stake community. So, yeah. but 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 this, this this didn't happen to you. Yeah, well, the thing is, I mean, uh, back then uh, there was this classic thing where like uh, half of the Sun a Million uh, winners would just instantly go to like the cash tables and, and dunk. dunk yeah, it exactly. All. That was very, very common. Yeah, exactly. I remember that uh, there was this thing where like the high stakes cash guys would be waiting right after the Sun a Million would finish uh, on the cash tables just to catch these guys. But um, now the thing is, uh, like, there weren't really many high stakes tournaments. And since I kind of like swore off cash games at that point, uh, then it's pretty hard to lose 100k. Like the biggest tournament that ran weekly was, I don't know, maybe what was it? Maybe it was the Sunday million. I don't think that there even was a 500. At some point, Super Tuesday came and it was once a week, one 1k. And I think I didn't even play that at the start because I mean, I mean, there were only sickos in there, in my mind anyway, back then. Um, so yeah, I, I think if you're not like DJing it, Dishing it up at the cash tables or like playing casino games or doing whatever else, it's it's pretty hard to burn through a 100k bankroll at, at those things. It depends because I was wondering the first time you won something, you mentioned like you know you won like 700 bucks. You spent half of it celebrating. Did you spend half of it celebrating as well? Because that 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 would go quite fast. Uh no I no no of course just but a I mean, crate of beer. That's it. The thing is like. Yeah, I, like if it's it's easy to spend a few hundred bucks on, on drinks, but it's not easy to spend 
I mean, right. now obviously, I guess it, it would be, but like back then I lived in the student town, like a beer cost like one euro or something, not, not even probably. So, I mean, and, and it's not like you, you could even drink cocktails all night and not spend more than like a few on a box. So I, I don't really think it would have been possible for me to burn through half of that uh, unless I did some really crazy stuff. So the, the Bing made you realize like, okay, wait, there's a lot of money involved in this game. There is a lot of potential. I see a certain career path. You also realize that strategically, you know, there's a lot of room to develop in poker. You also already mentioned that there were quite a lot of resources available. Do you remember still one of the first resources you tapped into when you were actually trying to improve as a poker player? And do you maybe still recall like what kind of strategical sort of aha moments you got from those resources? Um, yeah, I mean, I do remember that I, I got like subs because, because back then, like studying, it was basically forums and, um, and were you on and, poker news and now as well. No, not really. I was on uh, two plus two. I no ah. poker news now. I, I have an account there, but I, I never used it for a strategy. Uh, but I was on two plus two. I, I, I was somewhat active, I guess, uh, with, um, with like hand histories. And back then, it, the, the forum was really a good uh, resource, I think. And uh, yeah, the, the biggest training tool back then, I think, was uh, videos, training sites. Um, I remember there was this, I think it was called like Tournament Poker Edge or something like the before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember dude, that one. Cracked, like before Run It Once was around, basically, you had a couple of sites. I, I subbed to them. And I, I remember even thinking back then, like, wow, one of this, this some of this content is like really shit. <laughs> and I was a whale, right? Like, I mean, if you, I think if you look at back at some of these videos, uh, I mean, yeah, even 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 a whale like me would, would think like, okay, is this even worth it? Uh, but obviously, there would always be a couple of good coaches, and then I would learn a lot from 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 them, and and basically consume all the all their content. And then uh, after that, yeah, at some point, I'm not, I'm not sure when one started, but I remember very like consuming a very high amount of videos from them as well uh, at the start um yeah i mean solvers came around so much later like this was already when i was like kind of an established uh, entity rec i guess um so yeah it was mostly just talking head histories uh and then mostly like online through forums and uh, and just uh yeah watching videos basically yeah, usually people at some point in their career they find people who are on a similar journey. Was this the same for you that maybe on two plus two or maybe on some of these fours or where you're watching videos that you found other people who were kind of on the same path as you that yeah, you could start good. studying with, for example? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I had, uh, I was lucky enough that I had some friends who also played poker from my, uh, like, let's say high school football um, uh, friend group. And they were somewhat on the same tra trajectory as well. Um, I'm trying to think if I have any had any contact with like foreign people. I, I don't really remember. I don't I don't think so until uh, I got involved with Bitby as a uh, Pat's asked me to to come on as a coach, and and obviously then I made a made a lot of lot more contact like uh, contacts exponentially basically. Uh, but before that, I'm I'm not entirely sure. I don't think I really had like a study body or something like this. All right. Yeah. Adam, I'm uh, I'm curious. I actually looked you up on a uh, handem map to see if you have any tournament experience, and I saw zero results. Never, never dipped your feet into the live uh, MTT scene. Maybe you never cashed or just never entered. That's also an option, of course. Yeah, never entered. I knew how big of a whale I'd be in those games. Also playing in Bali, the live scene is zero. There's now obviously the trite in. There's Macau. There's stops, but. Uh, yeah, I feel like I'd be very much a whale in those games and yeah, it's having doubled. So you'll, you'll not find any MTT results from me <laughs> going forward. But yeah, John, I'm really interested to know your what happened after the Sunday Mill. So uh, obviously you've won this big bink and you've went into this kind of motivated state to uh, improve your game, which is great. And I think as Rene touched on, it's not the usual path. Most players go and play higher. The ego gets a bit inflated and they'll give a bit away to the higher games whilst they kind of learn. You seem to have had a very level-headed approach and went straight into working on your game. So uh, I'm wondering what changed after this, this big scope. So you mentioned your bankroll was quite secure. You couldn't go broke. So this gives you a peace of mind, which I think we'll get into later with why you've got such a strong mindset. But what, what changed after that sudden million win and how did you start to progress from that moment? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I was I was still studying uh, in, uh, at uni at the time. So I was like kind of splitting my time uh, between uh, these two things uh, I mean, there was more stuff I did, of course, but like roughly. Um, so I, I didn't really want to commit yet to being like a, a professional, so to speak. 
Um, but I did, I did really like, like before that I would maybe play like 90% uh, and then study 10% or something. And I, I definitely made a big uh, shift in that regard, like way more study time compared to, compared to playing time. Um, yeah, well, sorry, I, I, I forgot the, the other part of your question. Um, I guess it was about, about the mindset shift, right? Yeah, I, I don't know, like uh, getting this awareness that it was, that, that it would be, it could be a legit career path uh, was, was very important, I guess. And I guess I needed like a big win for that to, to become, uh, for, to, to become conscious of that. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it's, 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 I cannot really describe how it happened, but I remember that, that after, after this pink, I was really like, okay, I mean, I, I guess I can do this. And I guess there's really a lot more money in this than I, than I thought. Obviously I was aware of the prizes that, that were up top in big tournaments, but I, I never really pictured myself winning anything like that. Um, and yeah, after, after that, I, I, I was on a pretty steady grind. I think, um, if you, if you, if in those days, I think basically no one was studying a lot and everyone was, was terrible. I mean, compared to today's standards anyway. And I think if you outwork your opponents a little bit, in very soft games, you can really do very well. And I, I think uh, if, if, I mean, I could look back at the, at the results back then, like I think I was, I had a pretty steady grind, like not not a lot of variance, at least in in MPT sense, in terms of buy-ins, just a pretty uh, pretty nice steady lineup. Um, so it was, yeah, it was, it was a very good grind for me, but I, I didn't uh, I didn't call myself a, a poker professional until I don't know, probably like five, five years later or something. Uh, because I was, I mean, I was still set on finishing my uh, my uni uh, degree, but in the end, I, I miserably failed uh, after like five or six years of trying. You know, uh, yeah, I, I kept postponing the stuff that I didn't like, uh, and then in the end, you're left with like I don't know five courses or something that you still have to do. And I just, I mean, at some point, I was just playing so much poker and doing pretty well. I just couldn't find the motivation anymore. But it was a pretty big. Uh, L that I had to take like it, it really felt like a defeat to give up on that so that's why I think I, I held off on, on calling myself a professional for such a long time because yeah I, I really felt like I, it, it's kind of a failure if I if I don't even manage to finish like a, a bachelor degree but uh, at some point I was like I, I mean I, I kept registering at the beginning of the year maybe I'll do like one or two courses you know this kind of mindset obviously I mean I think maybe the last few years I, I paid my tuition and, and probably didn't do a single thing so uh, after that period, I was like, uh, I have to make a decision now. Like, this is obviously not worth it anymore to put any more thought or effort in. I just call myself a poker pro. And then I really went out and told people, like, I'm a poker pro now. And and once you say that, like, th this was the next step, I guess, to, like, professionalism. Um, then I, I made another shift, like, really started going for it, like, started planning my, my study process, like, um, you know, really... Uh, put a lot of effort into improving and getting the most out of it basically yeah very interesting so uh, i think from the outside looking in most people would be like what you won the sunday million you went back to uni just went back to class the next day and started studying the textbooks i'm sure like a lot of people would be like well i can't believe like you weren't able to do that but at the same time i can relate to um almost like unfinished business i can like myself go for university even though like i didn't know where it was going to lead to there's an element of this needs to be done this needs to be complete i need to tick this off and once you get like many years into it there's almost like in the back of your mind this just needs to be completed so i can relate to that uh, so for yourself like five years in this kind of playing poker and doing your studies how was it when you made that transition? So you said like they kind of called yourself a pro almost that moment where you're like, I'm pro now. And it was like everything changed in terms of a mindset shift. So in terms of your approach then, what changed? Was it the, just the hours you were able to put in? You already mentioned you were outworking some of your opponents at that time. So when you did go full-time pro, what, what sort of kind of approaches did you implement at that time? Yeah, well, I think like it, it was not like I was spending a lot of time on my my studies at that point anyway, like a little bit maybe, but really not that much. But it was mostly, I think, call, calling myself a pro really mattered in terms of like total hours that I that I put into improving. Uh, like playing volume was never really a problem because I really enjoyed it. Um, but at that point, I didn't really enjoy studying that much yet. So uh yeah, and, and once I started calling myself a pro, I was like, okay, now I have to have a you know somewhat professional approach if I want to succeed in this. And obviously now I also don't have like the excuse of like, oh yeah, I'm still doing uni. And whereas in reality, I was just watching Netflix on the couch or you know going out drinking with my friends. Um, yeah, so so like this this is a, another like it's like kind of a second mindset sh shift from being a part-time student and like a hobby player 
uh, to actually being a professional poker player, which comes, in my mind, at least it came with some uh, responsibility, like actually putting an effort in into improving and at least you know making very sure that you're a profitable player uh, also for the for the longer uh, longer run. It's interesting that the power of identity when we put a label on ourselves, like really not that nothing much changed like around you, but for you everything changed because now you're a pro. Now it's serious. Now it's I ain't wasting time. This is this like, is like career. I think almost literally nothing changed. Uh, like from from the one day to the next day, but I I just stopped calling myself a student and started calling myself a poker player, and it 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 made a lot of difference. And it, it it's weird how that works. Um, yeah, it's 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 kind of tough to explain, but I I yeah I, I came to the conclusion like I should just. I basically am a professional poker player, minus the, the taking like a full responsibility for it, basically. So I might as well start calling myself a professional poker player, tell other people that I'm a professional poker player, because it also creates a, a responsibility to the outside world, right? Uh, oh, you're a professional poker player, so what does your life look like? And I can just tell them like, yeah, I basically spent half my day on the couch um, and I just uh, do whatever I want. And then in the evening, maybe I'll, I'll play some tourneys and, and see what happens. Like, this is not really... I mean, then you're a poker player, but not a professional poker player. So, uh, I, yeah, I think I think telling people about this and and making this uh, shift from from being a student to a poker player was definitely a, a kind of a, an important uh, step for me. Yeah, and I think it's it's great for you that it was such a clear switch because it could have easily uh, almost like drifted in from being a student to being a poker pro, and I could have you know, you stopped studying and now you're kind of a pro, but you just went full. Okay, now I'm a pro. Everyone knows I am, and I'm going to fully identify as one and live my life as a as a pro. And I think it's really important because once you live, once you're trying to be an identity and you stay congruent with it, you tell people around you that's what you are. It's much easier to to live that life to stay with it because you're like, well, of course I'm a pro. Like this is this is the identity I've kind of stepped into. So yeah, really powerful. So in terms of like what happened after that, so we've got like probably this probably 2014 time I'm guessing. And yeah, how did things start to progress when you started to think take, them, take things more seriously? Obviously, your bankroll was already in a great place, which is often the thing most players at this stage of their career are trying to get their bankroll moving. You've already kind of ticked that box early in your career. So what are some of the kind of objectives at this stage of your career and how did it progress? Yeah, yeah. So uh, quickly to go, to go back to the size, because I think one one big reason that I that I uh, also was so set on like finishing my bachelor's degree was because I think in the back of my mind, I always had this feeling like, you know, I'm not 100% sure if it works out with poker. Like this is not, it's it's not a, it wasn't, wasn't a very conscious career path that I chose. Um, so what if it doesn't work out? And at least I want to have my bachelor's degree so I can do whatever, like a regular job if I want to, or like do, do a master's degree and I can get a job after that. So I think this was maybe also what helped me back a little bit that I always had this, um, yeah, this idea in the back of my mind, like I could still fail as a poker player, even though I think, it wasn't really a realistic possibility at that point anymore, um, but yeah, I, I, yeah. This, 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 I think, was also a big contributor to the to the, to the shift that I made after calling myself a uh, professional. But yeah, after after I did that, I I don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I think I I just had a very steady grind. Like uh, I, I really put even more time into improving. That's that's for sure. Um, I think this was also around the time that uh, I got involved with Bit B. Although I'm not 100 percent sure on the timeline, but. Um, yeah, at, at some point, um, Patrick Leonard, who was who was on the podcast, by the way, I, I saw a little bit of that too. Was uh, was a good guest. Uh, yeah, he he reached out to me um, because they had, they had just started the stable, I think, and he he just randomly in the in the Pokestars chat uh, asked for my contact info, and then uh, we started talking a little bit, and he, he told me like, yeah, we're looking for uh, for coaches, um, and uh, you seem to be a pretty good player. Are you interested? And then we worked out a deal, and uh, I started coaching for them. And it it's really uh, that that was really a big boost for me as well because I think I was like pretty decent before that. But if you really have a good network of people um, that are all very good, and I mean even those horses that were in the stable, a lot of them were also very good. Um, and you have a big group of people that you get constant feedback from. Uh, this this is really beneficial. And I I, I think before that I, I completely underestimated that. Um, and I even remember th thinking like, huh, do I really want to be a poker coach like is this something that i would enjoy i don't know i don't know these people like should i get involved with this and and i think if i look back on, on this period like i improved way quicker than i could have on my own like uh, you get so so much more input like yeah it's it's just a uh, really a big difference and i think uh, yeah there's, there's a big downside to doing, doing things on your own as well obviously there's some upsides but i think uh, a group process is uh, and especially in a time where i think this was still still before solver time although i'm not 100 sure but i think it, it, definitely like studying wasn't as structured as it can be right now 
uh, yeah, having a, having a group of people that, that talk about the game every single day or every every minute, basically, is, uh, is very beneficial. Mm. So it sounds so, like a big transition moment for yourself where you went from grinding solo, doing things by yourself, I'm guessing, with a, a small network to not much of a network around you, to then being in Big B amongst some of the best players in the world. How did that shift change you? Because I think it's, it's very interesting when you go from a just yourself mentality to where you're now involved in a team. There's a lot of like shifts that need to be made. Some of, the, some of them are natural, which feel nice. Some are like, oh, do I have to spend my own time on this? So tell me if you like that kind of transition period for you. Yeah, it was it was kind of uh, abrupt, I guess, because you yeah, you basically, uh, all of a sudden you become part of, of this big group of people. Um, and, and I think when I joined the stable, it wasn't that big yet, but like a lot of people joined after. Uh, so it's really a huge group and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I never really had that before. They can uh, talk hands with with other elite poker players, so to speak. I mean, I, I, in the grand scheme of things, I wasn't an elite poker player back then, I think. But um, yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the MTT scenes, like the big, the big, uh, the final end bosses were were all in those uh, in in that Discord server, for example. And I really I, I learned a lot from them, and I hope they also learned something from me. I, like obviously, I've all have different perspectives on the game and. But I think yeah, like getting input from from that level of player is is very important. And in uh, nowadays in entities, I, th I think it's a little bit more common. You have like especially in this like the super high roll scene, for example, you have like these kind of cliques or, or groups uh, that work together a little bit. I think, uh, and there's a reason I think for it because it's it's so much more uh, like you can improve so much faster if you if you if you work in a group. Um, it's also it help really helps for motivation, like seeing other people have great success. Um, or doing well with a certain strategy, it can really motivate you. Or like, see how hard pe other people work. Like, I mean, Pat's a good example of that. I mean, the guy, uh, <laughs> I don't think he ever slept. But this guy was just constantly answering to hand histories or whatever. Like, I have, I have no idea how he, how he even does that. So it, it can also be inspiring if you see other people like really work very hard and having success that way. Like, this can, this can be very, uh, very big motivator for yourself. Yeah, it's come up quite a lot on the podcast, the importance of a network and getting the right people around you. How do you think your career would have unfolded if the big big opportunity didn't arise? What trajectory were you, were you on at that point? And let's say that opportunity didn't come up. How do you think things would have unfolded over the next two or three years in particular? Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, I would have liked. Uh, I would like to think that I would have met other people somehow, um, maybe through live poker. Because like back then, I really didn't play live poker at all, basically. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, maybe I would have met other people that I could have worked with. I think at some point, if you have Good success in entities like that obviously uh stands out to some people like and and maybe people would have reached out or i mean i i also did this in the past so sometimes like reach out to someone who i think is good like try to get into contact i think something probably would have worked out but like really being thrown in a in a big group of people like a good network is, is obviously uh, very rare and very valuable i think this is something that people massively undervalue um I mean, not only in, in poker, I guess, in, in most uh, industries, uh, this is very, very valuable. And it, it's something that you cannot put a, put a price on, but it's, it's it, yeah, it's worth a lot. And it's something that I definitely very much underestimated before that. And even maybe, maybe even during that time, like it was mostly after I realized like, wow, this, this is actually a pretty sick opportunity that I got. And I'm glad I, I took it. And I had, I had enough sense to not like turn it down and be like, ah, no, I'll just do this on my own, you know? Because I, I, I was definitely a little bit of an, uh, Ansel Ganger, uh, I'm not sure if that's also an English word, but like I, I, a guy that does stuff on his own, like I like to study on my own um, and I still do, but like I, I now definitely see the value of, uh, of having a network and, and using it also. Yeah, hundred percent. You mentioned like being around people with good work ethic, sharing like like-minded people, sharing like histories and talking strategy. Also, like the group environment of like supporting each other, going through a shared experience. Poker players very often can feel isolated that they're the only person going through a, a certain experience. To be around other players who are like living the same life as you, and you're like, oh, just normal part of the, part of the part of the course. No big deal. It's a a nice thing to be involved in. So yeah, it sounds like you had the the right people at the right time. So for yourself, like, what were some of the challenges? moving up stakes because looking back and some of the questions we asked you uh, there wasn't like a particular like challenge or rock bottom moment that you've hit but i'm guessing like throughout the kind of rise of the, the top the top even being in the the big big community around great players i guess there's some challenges for yourself in terms of moving up stakes or progressing with your career anything that comes to mind in terms of challenges you ran into or challenging periods or years of your career moving up yeah um i think early on or like uh, let's say the first 
five, ten years, I don't really think there were that many. Like I, I've had some downswings, but nothing. I mean, especially compared to my bankroll, it wasn't that worrisome at the time. Like I've definitely had stretches where, especially in entities, this is, it is a big thing. I think because the downswings can extend, uh, you know, quite long. Uh, and and this is also why I like to play pretty decent volume always because time wise, if you're downswing, especially if you, let's say you play, you know, uh, live tournaments only. Your, your downswing could be three years, you know, and this is if you if you're on a three year downer, this is pretty uh, hard to take mentally, I think. And and online, if you play decent volume, obviously you can you could go through like a few months where you had a you know a slightly worse period, but uh, yeah, it's it, never really any longer than that. Um, so yeah, I've had a few of those, but I I, I don't really remember being very devastated by that. Uh, but I guess. If I would have to say name something from the, like uh, more recently, like online high stakes tournaments, it's just I yeah I've really struggled with those. Like I've always done really well in, in everything. Let's say up to five Ks, and then I, I think I, I would hope it's mostly variance, but I, I've really been destroyed in uh, in like let's say ten K plus online, and this is really like a barrier that's and this this is also why the Triton score is really nice for me because. Even though it was live, I would have preferred actually if it was online, uh, even though it was obviously a lot of fun to win a live tournament and it was fun that people could see it, like my friends and family and everything. But um, yeah, like this is definitely something that I'm still um, struggling with a little bit, like getting uh, getting good results in like 10k plus online, because I, obviously you play always play a tiny sample. I, I'm not even sure how many I played lifetime online, but it cannot be, be more than a few hundred. Um, so there's a lot of variance involved. And yeah, at some point you start thinking like, do I even beat these tournaments? Should I stop playing these tournaments? I've, I've definitely played with this idea as well. Like, you know, why would I do this to myself? Because, you know, you know your your whole year can be determined by results uh, of your 5K, 10K plus uh, games. And you can be printing in your uh, in your normal games and then lose it all back in the, in the 10Ks. Uh, that's not a lot of fun. So um, yeah, that, that's something that I still, I'm not 100% sure what my approach will be regarding that. I think, yeah, the more I study, I feel like I, I really, I'm pretty sure that I, I beat them. Um, so I kind of want to keep playing them, especially if it's not uh, an issue bankroll wise, then why would you skip plus EV games? Uh, but I think it's it's not even like a, like a monetary thing. It's more of like a, a starting to doubt yourself, you know, like I should be able to beat these fields, but then, you know, I, I've gone for months without uh, cashing any 10k like you know what's going on am i am i really beating these or am i just overestimating my overestimating my own ability and that's something that uh yeah i, I still struggle a little bit with but uh, obviously after trident uh yeah this is kind of like a monkey that i got off my back in, the, in that, that regard a little bit mm. yeah i think this is an interesting topic to touch on because i'm sure a lot of players can relate to this whether it's playing higher stakes like moving up stakes and cash games playing some high MDTs, which are the top end of your bankroll range, and then running bad in the, like in a small sample. Very common for players to have self-doubt and start worrying about, can I beat these games? And for you, you've got like high volume, you've got a good bankroll, you've got good win rates in all your other games. So a lot of the kind of data points tell you nothing to worry about. But when you keep playing these games, you keep losing. Now three months go by, four months, five months. Sometimes cash game players are shot taking a stake, they'll move back down a stake. And they've shot took five or six times, and each time they've lost five, six buy-ins, and it's starting to build a little, little bit of a sample. And it's starting to niggle at the back of the mind going, can I beat these games? Then there's the logical voice going, well, I should be able to, but what was it about Colin? So uh, I'm really interested to know like how uh, you deal with that in terms of like, what do you do? Like, do you uh, study harder? What's your kind of approach to uh, almost like giving yourself more confidence, overriding that self-doubt and allowing yourself to be logical in that moment to uh, keep moving forward if that's what you want to do and keep playing those games? Yeah, I, it definitely motivates me uh, to to uh, put in a lot more study hours. So uh, I guess that regard, it's also a good thing. Um, yeah, what else do I do? I, I, I guess I try to, uh, I mean, I try to analyze these fields a little bit and uh, yeah, for example, it's like a, there's a weekly tank on UG and, and if you look at this field, it's really not that much worse than like any other, let's say random 1K or whatever uh, on, on, on any different side. Like this, this feels pretty good. Uh, so. If I know I beat this one case for a certain amount, because I have a huge sample in these, like I can be pretty sure that I beat them for a certain amount. Uh, I should be able to also beat this 10K, right? But because you only play such a tiny sample, like it can take a long time. And, and to be fair, I've also been 
close to like huge scores many times uh, in, in like big big field 10Ks, for example, or 5Ks, like main events, uh, scoop, whatever, this kind of th stuff, final two tables, and just not winning that last flip to to make it to the top five or something. Um, and yeah, I mean, if, if I think back about those moments, like that makes you realize how big this variance really is, because if I won five flips more, I could have won like an extra two million or something, I guess, easily. And I mean, it's, it's really... Yeah, it's kind of demotivating to think about that kind of stuff. But then you also have to think like, obviously, I've won these flips in other spots, you know. But I, but you don't think about those because when you win, it's you, you kind of assume it's, it's it's a given, right? Like the fact that I won like probably twenty five flips uh, on my way to the Sunday Million Bink. That's not something you consciously think about too often. But yeah, if you, if you start thinking about okay, I'm losing in these ten k's, like what's you know what what's going wrong? It also goes right very often, just not in that spot. And I mean. Uh, in terms of like, if, I think if I would uh, plot all my high stakes results now, including like uh, Trident stuff and everything, uh, I, I'm doing very well, of course. But yeah, that switched around from like not doing so hot, maybe being like break even or slightly losing to, you know, uh, being uh, up a decent amount after like two tourneys uh, in Trident. So it's, uh, yeah, the, the variance is insane, but you also kind of have to embrace it. And this is also why these games run like, like no one. Um, really thinks who or uh, no one really knows who the, who the biggest winners are um yeah so there's a lot of uh, um yeah doubt about that and that's also why these games keep running and people keep firing them because there's also a lot of people playing them who are probably losers who think they are winners so yeah it's a, it's a good thing for in, in the long run for entities i think but it's also it can also uh, put some doubt into your mind sometimes yeah i think your story shows the importance of continually showing up always putting yourself in the games obviously with the right rationale with the right micro management the right skill set you obviously studying a lot to make sure your game's good you often you're checking the game quality to make sure they're similar to the other games you're playing but then you are showing up you're putting yourself in there even the trading stops you were there uh, so like you, you're in these games for many many years i think you said 15 years you've been playing overall that's a long time to be putting yourself in big games to get like a big score so i think it's a uh, so it's a reminder that like showing up is like most of the job sometimes to uh be there and that's sometimes the hardest part for poker players like the ability to override the self-doubt override the kind of the uncertainty of playing these games especially when the, when the results aren't coming in but for you you've you managed to find a way to continually push through that which is yeah a credit to you so yeah. i'm interested now to know sorry no, yeah, I was going to say, like, I think the, the showing up part, is, it, this is definitely a skill that is uh, very underrated, uh, I think, in general in poker, um, but especially in entities because the variance is so brutal. Uh, and I've, I've always been very good at that. And I think also because I, like, if you really enjoy the game that you're playing, it's just so much easier to show up. I think there's there's probably also a big subset of poker players who who are more in it for the money and not not especially because they, they enjoy playing that much anymore, maybe, like. I think there's a lot of people who still play who, who kind of lost the enjoyment in, in playing maybe and i think if you still have this uh yeah then it's way easier to to keep showing up but yeah i, I definitely also i think I'm, I'm pretty good at um at even during rough stretches just keep showing up and just keep doing what i'm doing and obviously i play so long uh, and i've been through these kind of stretches many times before that i i know at some point it's going to turn around again so having that experience is especially nowadays is very important but i think i've had this ability from the start and it's uh, yeah i'm not sure if it's necessarily a mindset thing i think it's yeah i think just enjoying what you're doing so even if it's not if the results are not really going your way i would still enjoy it so um yeah i, I think that really helps yeah, I think the enjoyment factor is huge in terms of being able to show up. If not, you're relying on discipline, willpower, making yourself push through. For you, it feels like you just wanted to be there. You just enjoyed yeah, the game yeah. from the start. So, so I'm curious, I think this is going to tie in with, with this already, but I'm, I'm thinking about if I was you, like you've won this Sunday Mill, so you've got like 100K plus in your, in your bankroll. Like you just recently won the tight the Trident series, so you've got like a big, big bankroll increase there. It feels like for you, like these things don't really change the trajectory so much for you. It feels like it's just like, ah, business as usual, back to work tomorrow. So uh, I wonder like how your goals have changed. Let's say like, let's talk about the initial, uh, kind of thinking the, the Sunday Million. How did that change your kind of goals and pocket why you play? Because I think a lot of players will be playing to have achievements, to hit financial goals, to move up stakes. And when those are achieved, they almost need to like stop and then go, well, what's next? For you, it feels like because you maybe enjoyed the game so much, you just keep going with, going with it. So first of all, when you won the, the tri sorry, the Sunday Million, any shifts that happen in terms of the goals you were setting yourself in poker then? Yeah, so back then, I think uh, the main goal was like, just to to get out of it what what's possibly in it so like i guess mostly that meant back then uh, financially uh and and it was i think back then not necessarily about 
you know achievement to the outside world or or being the best or something like that but more like okay wow this is actually i i if i go for this i could i could probably in the next few years and, and even back then there was talk about like poker dying uh, online at least uh, so this 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 talk has been around uh, since forever and i i remember even back then i thought like okay i mean i might only be able to do this you know for the next few years um so i might as well try to get out of it what's in there and, and you know like uh, really go for it and i you know if the ev is a couple hundred k or something or whatever i had in mind back then uh, it's obviously worth it worth it to go for that right so i think that's mainly uh, what motivated me back then i think over the years it really shifted uh, i mean it, because I've always been very competitive and, and especially like wanting to be beat other people at a game like this is something that I've always enjoyed and I'm really a terrible winner also if, if you lose a game to me I will really rub it in like I'm a, I'm a terrible ter terrible person to lose a game to but um yeah so this this is this has always given me a lot of enjoyment to like try to beat other people at a strategy game so I think uh yeah like not not losing to other people or or beating other people trying to 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 move up in the i guess i'm not even sure if you would call it power rankings or something like that but you know trying to be on the, on top that's that's i guess what motivated me later on a lot and i guess um more recently um i like i never really had monetary goals but i guess uh if i would have to set a goal i i, I would really like to be able to after my poker career say okay if i don't want to i would never have to work another day in my life um so that would be something that i i guess i have as sort of like some somewhat of a loose goal because i didn't really put it like a very specific dollar amount on that or euro amount i guess in my case but um i have like roughly something in mind that i would like to achieve financially and at that point i would think like now i'm completely independent um or at least i can live you know the kind of fun lifestyle that I have in mind and not not have to work anymore and just live off of passive uh, income uh, basically um but yeah i mean that's all that that number also changes uh, i mean if, if, if inflation uh stays at 15 percent or something uh, I, I might have to adjust that number a little bit but uh yeah this is something that i have in the back of my mind but it's not like a huge goal for me and also i'm, I'm a little bit more uh optimistic about um uh, like how long i can can play this game because i think like these talks about online dying have been around for so long and it, it didn't happen yet um and then there's always live poker as well even though i think the ev of, of playing a full live schedule is a little bit worse i think if i can play the higher stakes and and obviously i would have to sell a little bit but like if you can keep very good pieces of yourself um i think the ev of, of that is still pretty good as well and that will be around for i think i mean uh, probably forever like uh, there's no reason why life games would die necessarily so um uh, yeah i think uh in that that regard uh, i think my my future ev is pretty good and i i will try to get out out of it uh, what's in there basically that's that's mm -hmm. a lot of I love that. Yeah. It reminds me of, uh, we had Lucky Chibi on recently and we asked him why he still plays poker. And he said, it's the best game I've ever found. And it sounds like similar for you. It's a, a game you enjoy. You like the competition elements. You like beating your opponents. You like the progression, the financial opportunities, the achievements. One thing I want to touch on is when you're competitive, I think it's always interesting to know uh, how that works in reverse. So you mentioned like when you win, you'd like to rub in people's faces. What happens when you lose? Are you a sole loser? Do you have any troubles when things aren't going your way? Have you had any, anything uh, come up? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a very, very sore loser. Uh, I'll just be honest about that. I'm, I, I'm as bad as I, as I am at winning, I'm also very bad at losing. <laughs> and uh, in both scenarios, I'm completely insufferable. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm I'm very very bad loser. But I think this is I mean for me I think it's an asset. Even though um, yeah, I mean uh, I I get tilted sometimes, but not not to the point where I think it affects me too much, or I like it at least it doesn't affect the way I play. And I think also I'm very good at just like venting a little bit and then you know shaking it off. Like it, like I I don't I never have tilt for an extended amount of time. Like it's just a very short moment and then uh, then it passes basically. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it's a good motivator. I think really, uh, like if I am in a losing stretch and I think like yeah, these these people that I, I see winning are they're like half brain dead. Like well, why am I losing to these guys? Uh, there's a little bit of entitlement in, in in that, of course, but there's also it, it helps me helps me uh, to stay motivated and like to really try and show up every day and, and, and beat these guys because I should be able to, you know. Like and, and I think this kind of like 
being a sore loser and then this entitlement kind of helps me to keep going as well. Like it's kind of like a fuel uh, for, for the fire, the, the poker fire within me, so to speak. Yeah, literally what I wrote down just a second ago, it seems like you use it as fuel to keep showing up and keep coming back. And two things, you're able to shake it off quite quickly in terms of the frustration, maybe a, a few of the kind of lingering negative thoughts. And then quickly, it's just a fuel source to right? back at it, I'm beating these guys tomorrow, I want to be there. And this probably drives into your consistency, you want to show up, probably shows why you're always there. When, when I lose it, like if you win, you like winning, but if you lose, it's like, right, I'm I'm definitely there, which has probably led to your consistently high volume throughout the years, which has yeah, obviously been a, a good skill of yours. So yeah, really, really good. And it does that kind of answers a few of the questions I had in my mind coming into this conversation, because I was thinking, how have you, as an MC player, not had many like kind of mindset hiccups, but if you're using like the kind of downs downsides or downswings as um fuel to kind of keep you going you've already got your bankroll in a very good position and you're loving the game that you're playing it's like all right we've got a pretty good formula here to just show up play poker without too much of the the, the issues coming up so yeah really good yeah, uh, yeah. it for yourself it, it's, it's probably not always fun for people who are around me or like I, I like sometimes i go on a rant like how, how am i losing to these guys you know like this kind of stuff like really like get it out of my system and then there's, there's someone who's catching catching this right and then and then the next day I show up again and play again. And it's obviously, I, I you know, um, then, it's, then it goes better or, you know, whatever. So it's, it's, uh, it's probably not always uh, good for my environment, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's the way I deal with things. And there might be a better way out there. Like, um, certainly I think I, I could make some improvements on this, but on the other hand, like it's, it's worked for me for many, many years. Um, so maybe it's also not necessary to make any changes regarding that. Yeah, I agree. I think behaviors can be either adaptive or maladaptive. Adaptive meaning they serve a purpose and they they do get get the result you want. So for you, you want to get out of your system quickly when you've lost and then get back to it quickly. You do that without I mean, I mean shouting, punch at the table. It doesn't really matter because it doesn't. Uh, it, 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 it's not that bad. It's mostly just like probably like, uh, you know, ranting about other racks or something like this. Not, it, it's not like I, I'm punching here uh, holes in the wall or something like this. <laughs> nothing nothing that bad. So I, I guess in, 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 a, in some sense, I'm, I'm definitely... Uh, level-headed enough where I, yeah, like there's levels to tilt and I, I never get to that level of tilt let's say yeah it's also short-lived by the sounds of it like quite quick over yeah, you're not very, ruining very, it for hours. Yeah, yeah very quick because I, I've definitely also heard from others that that they they really go through like like phases or periods like of longer longer tilt uh or or especially entitlement I guess but yeah for me it's uh if if I just um rent a little bit or like uh yeah get it get it out of my system it's it's gone and I, I, I'll be able to move on uh, pretty quickly. So let's say it's a 10K before you've won the Trident recently and you're running deep and this looks like a tournament that you're going to potentially get a big score. You're chip leader, getting towards the final table and then you just bust out and you don't get it, don't get the big score you wanted. Hopes were high, entitlement was starting to build. You were like, oh, finally, I'm going to get a good result at this high buy-in. How quick would that be for you to be like, oh, well, it's just whatever and get over it? Half an hour, maybe. <laughs> well, well, yeah, no, it's really, yeah, it's, it's, it sounds funny maybe, but it's really like I, I would definitely I, I, because uh, I mean this literal scenario happens to me plenty of times, or I mean I, I don't want to exaggerate, but like a few times at least. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean I could even go back and, and read read the chats to whatever my my study buddies or a, a friends of poker, and, and I've definitely rented like oh how can I how can I go deep in this ten k again and just get wrecked in the end by by this uh, lucky guy or something. And but then yeah, like half an hour later, I'm like okay, I mean I guess I'll uh, you know run some spots and see see if I did anything wrong. And uh, yeah, it motivates me. Uh, I just have to have to like um, yeah get it get it out out of my system. And then then really uh, after that, I, I I calm down and, and I'm like okay, let's let's see what I can do better for the next one. And uh, let's let's study up and let's try to let let's try to beat these fuckers because that's that's kind of yeah I, I, that's important for me like i I, uh, I don't want to lose to these guys and I, I don't think i should so there's some way I, i'm gonna find a way to 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 not lose to them and uh yeah it might take some time but um that, that's that's kind of what keeps keeps me coming back yeah yeah it's a very good formula i think it's an, an element of acceptance you accept that it's happened obviously a little bit of ranting in the short term you let it go it's done no no point ruminating over it and then you just move on and i think often players get caught because they end up in a story narrative they just replay in the story of oh i ran bad and that situation happened they'll tell one friend and another friend they'll wake up the next day and they'll they're just constantly going over the story narrative where for you you just almost like get out quickly forget about it and the, the story's not repeating it's now it's like all right back to work i'm gonna beat these guys this is not happening again so it's a yeah really really good like in a system of just let things go and then getting back to work in terms of things you do control yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's how I do it basically.
How about for yourself, Rene? I know you're a competitive guy. How do things go when you're not getting your own way? I uh, I feel very similar to Jens. I, uh, to Jens, I have the same. Like, if for example, you know, I'm losing, and I review, and I saw that I, for example, made a lot of mistakes, and I see a lot of room for improvement, then this actually motivates me. It's like, oh well, well, actually, it's good that I see this now. You know, and I'm motivated to implement these these points that I can improve on. And if it's the opposite, like, fuck, I'm doing everything right. Okay, this is just a matter of time. Then I also want to go back. So. Yeah, regardless, you, you're you're excited to go start playing poker again. So that's, I think, uh, I think a very important. I think for me, the main thing, because I would say volume has been usually, uh, um, I would say, reflecting on my whole career, probably volume has always been the biggest league, which is, for me, was always mental game related, which for me actually came more to like a fear of failure type of thing. So I would... For example, if I would be winning, I would close close a session early because I want to get that winning feeling, right? That was very important for me. Um, or I would, for example, try to make sure everything is perfect before I start playing in order to make the chances of failing smaller. Okay, so these are like, for, the, for, for example, certain things that I had to work on in order to make sure that I can actually put the volume in because as, as Jan's already said, the, putting the volume in is very important. So that's for me personally, has definitely been something that I've improved now that I play, or at least this year, since I can call myself a professional poker player again, I, I experienced something similar as Jans. Like the years before, I've been mainly focusing on coaching. Then you know, uh, we, we have uh, I, tr I tried to start uh, the poker ambition uh, coaching business. Did maybe not end, you know, or at least it's it's looking a bit different now, right? Only mechanics of poker coaching program. Me and Adam, shout out to the program. Um, and now this year, I'm more of a pro again. If people ask me more in the past, I would say, yeah, I'm a bit of everything. But this year, I feel more like a professional. So also my volume, for example, I've already played more, I think, than whole last year combined. And what what are we? Beginning of April now. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that is definitely that has definitely changed a lot. But I can I can I can completely relate well, to with, with with regards to volume. Like I, I also don't really understand how how people do it that they don't play a lot of volume because. For example, I, I've made this mistake in the past where I, uh, before like a big online series, let's say Scoop, right? Which is like mm -hmm. three weeks or something, or uh, nowadays even longer, like full uh, grind mode. And I would take two weeks off, right? Like, you know, let's let's rest up, like uh, take my mind off, off of work a little bit. And then I would start, like the first Sunday would be a big, big, uh, like high buy and day. And I would be completely rusty. And I don't know, even if I play, don't play for a week and I've played for like 15 years straight, right? If I don't play for a week, I feel completely rusty. I, even like the, the simplest pre-flop spots. And I think it will, I mean, I will still be plus EV and I will still play at a decent level, but I, I try to strive for perfect, perfection, especially in like the simple spots because it's so easy to do, right? Like, or, or it's so easy to, uh, yeah, to, to reach per perfection in these spots uh, that are completely solved. And yeah, like I, get, I, I really noticed that I get rusty. So I, I always think about like, for example, these these people that only play live and like go from 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 live stop to live stop. They have extended periods of not playing. I, I have no idea how they how they stay sharp. Or yeah, I, I guess maybe maybe it's just my uh, maybe it's just something that I experience and not everyone has this that, it, that they feel rusty after a little while. But I, I definitely uh, it's a big thing for me that I I need this volume to to stay at a certain level. And I think I. Or at least for my for the standards that I set for myself, I, I feel there's like there's like quite a quite a big drop off if I if I don't play uh, volume. I can uh, I can relate to that. I feel like a lot of players that I speak to experience the same. A very common one is oh I went on a two week holiday or something, come back and it's like okay what was the sequence again? Does a set be two pair? What is higher, flush or straight? It's, it's, you know it's yeah. maybe not that bad, but you know it's 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 very similar. And then I remember also when I was playing like. Uh, really full time at the top of my game I, I was so not looking forward to a holiday because I would know like okay usually already the week before a holiday when you're playing it's like well I'm going on holiday next week so it almost feels like that week sort of I don't know it's really weird it's almost like it doesn't count because it's gonna quit I'm not really working on something so that week is already a bit meh let's say you go on holiday one two three weeks so that's already a month gone and then you come back and the first week you're super rusty you know you need to get back in the flow so a two week holiday can easily cost me like one and a half month in EV or something. So yeah. I was looking at holidays. And I was like, hmm, maybe, may, maybe not a good idea actually to take holiday. And I, like you said, like I often didn't really feel like I needed one. So 
Uh, but yeah, well, I, think, I, think I mean, you're in a relationship. I'm sure your girlfriend might disagree on this one. My wife strongly disagreed on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think if you uh, if you really enjoy what you do, you you don't need to escape that basically, right? Like uh, for some people, maybe who don't really in, in, enjoy their day to day job or something, a holiday really feels like an escape. And I, th I think we both don't have that, which is I think a very positive thing because you can obviously still on holidays because it's enjoyable, but not because you need one. Or I mean, I even spoke to people who have like high high stress jobs. And uh, I've heard about this thing where even they need a few days before they go on holiday to to really calm down because they if they would go on holiday immediately after, you know, let's say Friday, last work day, they leave on Saturday. They couldn't enjoy the first few days because they're still in their mind so stressed about their uh, about their job, apparently, which is something that's completely foreign to me. I cannot even imagine this being a thing. Uh, and, and that's why they leave a few days later, because they they wouldn't enjoy the first few days anyway. And this is I mean, like. I don't know how these people don't just quit on the spot. I guess I mean there's obviously a lot of incentives involved, but and, and not yeah they, like I, I I know why, but uh, yeah like I I couldn't I couldn't imagine having to deal with that, and and that's why I think I'm super super lucky to to have found poker and and have found something that I really enjoy that I'm somewhat good at and uh, I can I make a comfortable living with it. Like it's it's obviously uh, insane and and it's good to to realize sometimes. Yeah, the quote that comes to mind is "Create a life so awesome a holiday sounds boring." That's right. a quote that yeah, I heard. Yeah. That's kind of what, what 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 you're referring to. But I think it's like societal standard, right? Friday is the day to celebrate because it's weekend and Monday is doom day. Well, yeah. I, I I often actually have sort of the opposite. I sometimes crave towards like Monday, which is like start of the week. Things are in my control. You know, I'm back into my routine. That's where I feel, feel nicest. And when it's like Sunday and I have nothing planned, it's almost like I'm a bit, wait, there's nothing? What Then what do we do now? You know, it's like you, you don't really feel in flow. It's funny that you say that because it actually kind of is like that for me that where Friday is like the celebration, that, but it's only because Sunday is, is the biggest day for entities. So like you never party on Saturday, right? Because I mean, yeah, if you if you throw away the highest TV day of the week, it, it's kind of done. So you end up celebrating on Friday. Usually if you if you want to party, you do it on Friday. And then Monday is kind of like the hangover day because the Sunday grind is on average goes way later than, than a weekday grind. Uh, so yeah, that's when I get the worst sleep. Uh, probably usually if you if you have a deep run or, or you win something there's some adrenaline in your system and I, I definitely noticed that I sleep worse after something like that for example so Monday is usually actually kind of my uh, yeah like kind of hang, hangover day not not alcohol wise but like yeah like a, a work hangover kind of uh, so I always I, I never plan anything on, on, on Mondays I always tell my girlfriend like leave me alone on Monday like <laughs> don't uh, don't bother me on Monday like I, I just want to chill uh, it's also usually not a day that I study a lot, for example. So it, it's funny that, that in that regard, it kind of matches like a normal work week, kind of uh, uh, like a regular job kind of thing. But I guess for cash, it's, it's obviously completely different. Though. For all the poker players listening out there partying on Saturday, even though Sunday is the biggest day, you're a poker cool. player, but not a professional poker player, as you pointed this that, out. Because if you're a professional, that's not something that you do. But that's that's definitely one of the things. That's a very good example of of the, the the stuff that I I quit doing after making the shift to to being a professional. And probably not completely because and I, I mean if you're 22, you can you can you know uh, drink a lot of uh, stuff the night before, wake up and, at nine uh, at nine in the morning and just function pretty well, right? But if you're 30, this is definitely not something that uh, I mean I mean not something that I could could do. And I'm 32 and if I if I drink on Saturday, I, I I will not have a good Sunday session. So yeah, that's that's the kind of stuff that yeah, like that's a little bit of professionalism, and that's not even. I mean, I you could also say like that's that's to be expected from anyone that plays for these mistakes. But uh, I think definitely something that that a lot of people maybe do wrong. Yeah. Yeah. When you were talking about these are like your views of being a professional, right? I think earlier you you named responsibilities. These are certain responsibilities that come with the profession of being a professional poker player. Remember a little while ago, I think it was Ben C B that put out a tweet about like sacrifices made for his career. Do, do you remember that? What's what's like your views on that? Because sacrifices could be maybe like a lot of the things that some people call sacrifice, you just see as listen, this is this is your responsibility as a professional poker player. Yeah, yeah, I remember reading a little bit. Uh, I saw also um, Henrik Heckman's uh, response, who was on the other, completely other side of uh, the spectrum. Uh, I would say I, I lean a little bit towards uh, uh, Henrik's uh, stand on that, but um, 
I, like the thing with Ben Savi's advice, I think it's very good advice for a very small amount of people. And then for a lot of people, it's it's terrible advice. And so you cannot really say it's it's bad advice per se, but like, I think for a lot of people, it really is not a good idea to like be a slave to the, to your, your, your poker playing uh, thing, like only playing, only studying, never partying. This is like spending your twenties like that. It's just, I mean, you will regret, regret that the rest of your life, I think. Um, so I would not recommend doing that. I think for some people who really go overboard, like partying and, you know, like who really deal with that side of things, not very well, it could be great advice because that could be the best thing that they could do, right? Completely focus on one thing. But I think in general, that should not be the way you should strive to live your life. At least for me, this, yeah, this would take a lot of enjoyment out of my life. And, and, and I think that way it's, it's not, it's not such great advice, but I, I do think like, if your only goal in life is to succeed at poker, then it's sure to do it that way. But I think at least for me, my goal is to just be as happy as I can be. And that would also involve doing some fun stuff. And that doesn't involve just sitting in front of my computer 24 seven, grinding it out and, uh, and studying. Uh, like this is not, not what I view as a fun life. As much as I love playing poker and studying poker, I cannot do it 24 seven. I, I need to do some fun stuff in my life as well. So, I would say um, I, I don't think it's it's great advice for most people. Yeah, and I also think personally downtime is necessary. I mean, Mr. Mr. Performance, yeah. Adam, I'm sure, you know, there's only so much in your brain that at some point your brain is like, okay, now we need a break because I need to process everything. If you just keep on going, I think it never really, you know, is that correct? You understand what I mean? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, downtime's needed almost. Like it's the recovery process. Like say you go to the gym, people think you get stronger in the gym. It's actually after the gym where you go to sleep, where all the recovery is done, all the growth. Same with learning, learning like kind of all the synapses in your brain get triggered. But actually the learning occurs when you're in the downtime, when you're recovering, you're sleeping, you're, you've got time for those connections to form. So yeah, downtime is definitely needed for, for, le for learning. Yeah, then obviously don't, if you then, for example, like partying as like your relaxation or your downtime, don't do that on a Saturday. If Sunday is your big grind, that's obviously professionalism but i think a lot of the things that come with professionalism for example i personally quit drinking because i was like okay i'm trying to become the best poker player i need my brain so why would i drink it just made no sense to me and then people say oh it's such a big sacrifice but i personally didn't really see it as a sacrifice i didn't really see it as a sacrifice it was just like yeah this is in line with my goals so it doesn't really bother me that you know now i don't drink for example yeah i think i think if you uh drink like if you don't miss it then there's no not really a reason to do it uh, I think if you, like I, I uh, did uh, dry January uh, this year, for example, I could definitely notice, um, I'm not a huge drinker, but I, I like, I think I would, I, I drink, I think I drink it a little bit more than the average person, I would say. And I could definitely notice a difference, like in terms of fitness or like, yeah, I'm not even sure if, it, if my mind was clear, but like your sleep, sleep improves, for example, a lot, like this kind of stuff. It, it would definitely be helpful for me long-term to do this for my poker career, for, for basically for a lot of things like productivity in general. But then on the other hand, I, I definitely also missed it in a social setting. I like, I went out for dinner a few times and then everyone's drinking and you're not drinking and it's still enjoyable, but like it would, I, I feel like it would definitely be more enjoyable, but it, it made me more conscious about like, you know, capping your, your drinking at a certain amount and not going overboard with it because it's very easy to just drink way too much. And just picking your spots basically right like a nice dinner with friends then you drink a few glasses of wine uh but you know don't drink casually so often like this kind of thing it makes make, made me uh, a lot more conscious in that, in that regard um but yeah i think if, if it's not a sacrifice for you then why, why would you keep doing it right yeah and like in general oh uh now playing more or studying more yeah if it's something that you enjoy i don't think the word sacrifice is yeah, if for some for some person it might be a sacrifice and for the other one not. And I agree, you cannot make too much sacrifices because then poker playing becomes sort of in the way of actually the life that you want to live. And I don't think that's sustainable either. So I agree, like you, you have to find probably a sweet spot in the middle. I like the picker spots, for example, then if I would go on a holiday or like a weekend away or something, sure, I'll, I'll, ha I'll have a drink. But I do also know like just, Especially, I mean, you're, you're from Groningen. That, that's where they drink a lot. But in general, I think Dutch people, they well, drink a lot. That's where, where I learned, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but especially in Groningen, the more north you go, oh, they, they start drinking. But they, like you probably then also, or at least I noticed that nowadays, if I would, for example, go back to my hometown, the amount of alcohol people drink. And it's like, 
picking your spots. I'm like, yeah, I'm just not going to stand here randomly, you know, drink 15 beers. It's not really in line. But if I go for a nice dinner and there's a nice wine that I can appreciate, then I'll sure I'll have a nice wine. So I'm way more of a appreciative drinker now, but I would rarely drink more than two glasses. And to be fair, two glasses nowadays already gets me drunk. Yeah, but I think anyway. it's also just a natural way of maturing, right? Like, especially if you, if you're a uni student, like drinking is just kind of part of the 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 yeah the the culture, and then I mean that that's that kind of it it can kind of stay with you. I think in the years after you're studying, but then at some point it starts to take more and more physical toll, and like you you just are interested in different things in life, and I think it's also kind of a a natural way of maturing. I think a lot of people go through that kind of process. I feel like, yeah, I think in general, you know, let's say, for example, you start to, you, you start to eat a bit healthier, you start to work out, you suddenly feel better, right? You're sleeping better, you're performing better. Then at some point, it's no longer a sacrifice. It's like, why, why do I want to go back to feeling more shitty? Can, can someone explain this to me? You know, actually, uh, with, uh, with regards to that, um, I, I, because I watched Van Heath uh, on your, uh, on your mm-hmm. podcast and uh, he said this thing where he was like, I, um, on live trips, I won't drink until the last day so like basically until the last hand is played i guess for him <laughs> uh and so i went to try it uh, because i watched this before uh, i tried in vietnam and i was like fuck it i'm gonna do this right like this seems like a pretty gto approach and uh also like uh, what you said about like um ebt stuff for example like it's it's a little bit feels a little bit more also as a vacation so you, you would definitely like in the middle of the, the trip just go for a random night of partying or something uh and i was like okay if i go if i you know, I sell some action here. I I play very high stakes tournaments against very good players. Like I just that's that seems like a pretty um, easy step to take to increase your EV, right? Uh, so I, I decided to uh, together with uh, Jesper, who I who I went with there, to not drink until the last day. And obviously, I went <laughs> won the thirty k, and uh, I, I I failed in this task. But I think I mean. Uh, we didn't uh, have the stipulation, but I think it, it's it's reasonable to have have a beer after you uh, after you win uh, another case. Okay. So uh, I didn't I didn't uh, make it the whole way, but I I didn't drink during play or anything like this. Like I, I had one or two beers, I think, after this win, uh, jumped into the next tournament, and uh, and then the last night we had a we had a good party night after um, after all the tournaments were done. But uh, I think uh, yeah, th- this is definitely the kind of um, yeah, like it's just a part of being a professional, right? And it, it definitely helps you, I think. Yeah, and then indeed, again, pick your spots. And then in the end of the series, you know, by all means, do celebrate because you also don't want to become a robot, be like, no, no, focused always, blah, blah, blah. Because then, then like, th- then where's the fun part? Again, you know, we have to find a, a, sort, of, a yeah, know, sort of sweet spot. Yeah, there's this thing about like, uh, what is it, work, li- living, working to live or living to work or something mm-hmm. like, you know, like, I think, and I've, 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 been, thought about this quite a bit like i don't want to be the guy who just only grinds with the goal to have uh you know a nice life after i'm done like i I think it it should you should enjoy yourself during uh, this process like i I don't think working very very hard and then trying to enjoy your life after you're 60 like the way basically society is set up right like uh you retire and then if you're lucky you have another 20 years or something you're not in a good physical shape usually uh, at that age. Like I, I think the way this is set up is 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 pretty bad. I, I would think it's probably a lot better to just keep working longer and work less hours a week or something and have a little bit more uh, enjoyable life. So I don't know. I, I feel like uh, if we're uh, like in a hundred years, society will not work in that way anymore. And, and yeah, I, I'm not really sure why we uh, set it up that way, but um, I don't think it uh, it works very well for for most people. I think this is what uh, Bill Perkins book is about, right? Like die with zero, where he's like, yeah, you shouldn't wait until you're pensionized because then basically your health is no longer... Basically, I, th- I think it's more about uh, at certain stage of your life because of your, for example, physical health, you can do certain things that you right. might not be able to do again when you're 70, 60 or something. So uh, at every that. age span, you should take full advantage of what you can experience only in that age span. And then basically uh, die uh, with zero. When you die, you should have zero. Right, yeah, I haven't read this book. I, I always assumed that it was just about spending your money uh, before. Because, I mean, obviously, especially back in the day, like, I, I remember, like, my grandparents, for example, like, like everyone would always be saving their money, right? Like, you cannot spend anything. You have to save it and send, send your child, children off in relative wealth or something. And, I mean, this is just complete, complete bullshit, in my opinion. You don't have to sacrifice your, your whole life 
to work. I mean, it's obviously nice to send off your kids in the right way, but they should also be self-sustaining at some point. Yeah, you should give them a head start maybe, you know. And yeah, But sure. basically, I think more your job is to educate them in a way so they can accumulate wealth themselves. Why give your wealth to them? I think actually that's probably the worst thing you can do because there's no more necessity for them to develop. Exactly. And and uh, and I think also like, that, yeah, you're just kind of like cheating yourself out of a nice life by not spending whatever you work very hard for to achieve. So I, I always assumed the book was about that, but I guess it's more about, um, I, I haven't read it, but. Uh... Yeah, it, it, it's, it's more about realizing what you can do, or at least that's my take, take away, like realizing what you can do at a certain moment and taking them for Avengers instead of waiting till your pension eyes to be like, oh, now I'm going to do everything. But in the meantime, you know, you're old, you're, you have certain diseases or you have certain pains yeah. from your work, you're, you're stressed out. You know, that's, that's I indeed, I agree. It's not really the life that you want to live. Yeah. And I think a lot of people kind of fall for that trap of uh, working very hard when they're like young slash middle aged. And then, you know, at some point they realize like, fuck, I've wasted a lot of time just you know, working and, and, and kind of wasting my, my good years, so to speak. So I, I try to really consciously not fall for that trap. And I think if you enjoy what you do, it's, it's less of a trap because most of your time is spent on something that you already enjoy. So it's not really a waste or anything like that. But um, I think a lot of people fall into this trap, especially people with, who have regular jobs and uh, in poker is probably not that common, I guess. I, uh, I want to touch on some points that you, uh, you talked about with Adam. We were talking about... Um um like for example you, you talked about it very easily yeah you know it's just a matter of getting to the last few tables and then winning a couple flips obviously again it's like i think the skill the skill is in getting yourself in a position where you're in the position to win the flip for the final table right that's kind of the skill element for the for the audience uh, and again like the skill element with all the variants involved is then handling the variance that then becomes the skill Handling the variance in the correct way that it doesn't influence you, so you don't have to take a break. A break, so you can actually put your volume in like like you do. That's that then becomes the skill. So I thought that was an interesting point to touch on. And I also wanted to ask because you keep on mentioning enjoyment of the game. What? How do you make sure that poker remains fun for you to play? Um, yeah, well, there's like there's always uh, things to uh, to work towards, like. Uh, you, you... I, th I think if you look at um, what level the the best possible tournament player would be on and how far I, I, anyone is removed from that, and I, me too, of course, like there's such a big gap uh, to, to fill still. And obviously you work to, towards that point incrementally and, and it's it's a utopia. You can never reach, like you can never be this perfect bot who plays perfect. And there's so many factors, like no one even knows what it would look like, but um yeah, that, that's that's definitely what motivates me. Like incrementally trying to get to a higher level, and then obviously, um, yeah, I, you should always strive, in my opinion, to be the top dog in in any tournament. And uh, I think currently that's not the case. So that's definitely. I, I don't know what it would be like to be the top dog. I guess it's usually not very clear who is the top dog. But like, yeah, I, I guess working towards uh, trying to be the, the very best. Uh, that's that's something that I I get a lot of motivation out of. Um, yeah, for sure. For, uh, in, in day to day, basically, I can strongly relate to this. For example, if you would tell me, okay, you're not allowed to do any strategy for three months, but you do have to grind, and you know, you cannot then use the grind as sort of strategy, then it becomes, then they're just going through the motion, and then I would burn out very quickly. But I need like strategical impulses so that when I go into a session, there's like certain spots that I'm curious for. That kind of fusion, you know, that spot comes up that you study. It's like, hey, this is indeed that situation. Oh, I used to play this way, but now I understand this way is way better. And then especially if you see it work and you got him, it's like ta -ta -ta, yeah. that study hours paying off. Yeah, there's a lot of enjoyment in, the, in this in this process of like making these small changes, experiencing them in game and, and, and uh, noticing like, oh, I now I have a better understanding of the spot. Uh, yeah, like it, it's very small things like this that that really make it more enjoyable. I think, and I, I think if there's no process of of improvement, like you said, like if you if I was forced to just show up, play a certain schedule, this would start to feel like work. And I mean, yeah, I guess I I, I wouldn't like working that way. Like it it would feel like a nine to five job, and, and I I wouldn't enjoy that uh, at all. I think. I get a flashback towards a session that I once did with Elliot Rowe. We're talking 2016, 17, very long time ago when Elliot Rowe was still affordable. Uh, yeah. So 
Was he ever? <laughs> he 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 made a he made me visualize. I remember two grinds. I, I don't recall what the topic was. Probably it was around volume. Surprise, surprise! As I already pointed out, it was definitely a leak. And then I said, yeah, you know, I should just play more tables, grind more. And then I think he made me visualize both grinds. And one was playing more volume, like more volume, just grinding, you know, not making it too difficult for himself, just executing a strategy. And the other one was more taking more time to study, trying to become a better player, which often players would say that's harder. And then I, he made me sort of visualize both grinds. And I very quickly came to the conclusion that just grinding it out is a way harder grind than just doing a lot of strategy and trying to actually become a very good player because that's something that you get a lot of fuel back. You get very motivated, so it fuels you. And the other one only would cost me energy, and I would there would never be anything in my day to day grind that would give me energy back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's very important. And um, yeah, ideally, like in a real world, jobs would be designed in a way where everyone would have a job where they get this kind of fulfillment uh, from it. But I think sadly, like a lot of people are stuck in in situations where they don't have this uh this kind of loop and, and it's more like only giving and not not getting back from it and and that's i think this is why people get burnouts i think like yeah exactly because it's not like it's not like necessarily the hours that you work i think burnout works more i've listened to the podcast about this and they they explain it more in terms of indeed energy like how much energy does something cost you and how much do you get back from it and basically when that is off balance that's when you burn out yeah yeah i think so too so for for a lot of players listening that might feel a bit like burnout or that field poker has become more of a grind I would strongly recommend that you know having new strategical impulses and being more curious about the game excited about the game i mean the word excited already kind of says few right you get excited and yeah. uh, that actually it might look harder but it's actually way easier to implement yeah and oh. i think if you don't have this in your in your current uh like schedule or whatever games you play then it's probably time to switch something up or change something because uh yeah, you cannot. I, I imagine you cannot really keep going for very long if you don't if you don't have this uh, kind of journey. Hi guys, Renee, aka the Weko here with a quick Mechanics of Poker 2.0 announcement. In our program, you will get access to 80 plus hours of content in which we will explain you all aspects needed in order to become a more successful poker player. Now, one of these, of course, is the technical aspect of the game in which I'll be explaining you all the mechanics behind poker strategies. We'll be talking about GTO, exploitive play with an extra focus on the why behind certain strategies and why the population has certain leaks. And to increase your win rate even further, we've recently added a river bluff and bluff catching section so you can increase your EV when those pots become very big. Our mindset and performance coach Adam Carmichael, he took care of the mental game and performance section of this program in which he will teach you everything you need to know in order to break through limiting beliefs, better handle your emotions, break free from tilt and play your A game more consistently. And last but not least, we've added the management and optimization section in the program in which we will give you various tips and tricks to make it more likely for your poker career to succeed and how to continuously improve as a poker player. Now on top of that, this concept is continuously evolving based on feedback and suggestions we get from our community. Next to all this content, you will have access to our exclusive Discord community, monthly live Q&A calls, and one-on-one -on -one coaching session in which we are going to be reviewing if you have been implementing the stuff that we teach you in the mechanics of poker correctly. So do you think you have what it takes to master the mechanics of poker? Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com and maybe you will get a chance to work with me and Adam and make more progress in your poker career. But for now, without further ado, let's get back into more goodness in today's episode. At some point you uh, moved away from the Netherlands and you now live in like the poker capital of Europe, Vienna. What has made you decide to move to Vienna? Yeah, so um, back then, uh, or uh, I mean, yeah, back then it was the, the 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 way the tax system worked in the Netherlands. It was a little bit of a, a gray area still, or at least I was I was paying taxes, um, but it was unclear if we were able to claim those back at some point. Uh, and and the, the way the system works, it, it's it's pretty bad for uh, for MTT players because it was a monthly tax um and obviously uh or at least um, the way it was set up is like you cannot um 
claim back your losses uh, in losing months. So basically, if you have a losing month uh, in the in the end of the year, it ends you end up paying a lot more effective tax than the thirty percent that they were charging in the winning months because the losing months you don't get any any money back. Um, and obviously, in entities, it's very hard to not have a losing month every once in, once in a while, especially if you play high stakes. Uh, so that was um, that was just not very attractive, and there was some chance that we would get the taxes back. In the end, uh, the court case was won. I, I still have to go through this process, by the way. I think I think I got back like a pretty decent amount of money, but I you have to claim it, of course. So I still have to. Uh, this is the, this is the stuff that poker players are not very good at, like uh, the the administration side of things. But uh, I I still have to do this. Uh, in the end, it worked out. Uh, but yeah, I was this, this was very uh, uncertain, and also, I mean, there was a regulation coming up of the uh, the gambling market, and it was also uncertain if you could. Uh, keep playing on on all sides, and in the end, um, all sides uh, went went uh, black. And I think only GG got a license uh, immediately, and the rest, uh, I mean, stars. I think they're still waiting on uh, on uh, stars to get a license. So yeah, all this stuff I didn't really want to have to deal with anymore. Um, and then I was uh, at the time I was uh, I was single, so I was like, okay, I mean, if I ever want to live abroad, this would be a pretty good time to do it. Uh, I have basically all the freedom that I can uh, hope for. And yeah, like financially, it makes a lot of sense to do. Uh, and, and I've, uh, I'm not sure exactly how it happened. Like I've, I met some other guys, um, I think at a live stop, like Dutch guys. Uh, and then we were talking about this and, uh, or it was one guy and in the end, a friend of his also uh, moved, moved with us. Uh, but yeah, he was also interested. And in, um, then we just kind of ended up organizing it and uh, yeah, just, Vienna seemed like a pretty good choice because there's so many poker players who live here. Um, it's still pretty close to the Netherlands, uh, so I could still visit whenever I want pretty easily uh, with not having to put too much time into the traveling. And then, um, yeah, like it's central. Like if you, it, if you think about live poker, like uh, the EPTs and everything, you can get, every, like I can go by train to Prague, for example. Like this is uh, also a pretty big upside, I guess. So yeah, it was it was a pretty uh, easy choice, kind of, and um, I definitely uh, definitely uh, don't regret it. I, I really enjoy uh, Vienna and living here. Um, obviously, it was a little bit weird because COVID hit right. Basically, we we moved in uh, I think in July or June, and then I mean the end of the year, COVID was uh, was a big thing already, and uh, it was basically uh, I don't know one and a half two years of lockdowns or something. So it was a little bit weird. Uh, like one of the reasons also that I moved here tax wise was to be able to play live tournaments outside of um, Europe because those were taxed so heavily that you couldn't, basically couldn't play them. Uh, so I, I thought, okay, like the, the summer after I, I move here, I'm gonna go to Vegas and like, you know, grind a full WSP. This is, I don't wanna call it a dream, but like every every tournament professional should play at least one full schedule in the summer, I think in, in Vegas. Like this is just something that you need to experience. Uh, and Coming summer, I'm fin finally gonna do it after you know three, four years or something, however long it's been. Um, so yeah, I had to put those kind of plans on hold a little bit. And obviously, life in Vienna was also a little bit different in uh, lockdown times compared to uh, right now. But uh, very enjoyable, uh, very very cool city to live. I'm curious. So you 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 you're always trying to become a better poker player. You mentioned you're living in Vienna. You you team up with or at least you you team up with other poker players. Everything trying you're trying to do everything in order to get better. I'm curious, like take us through a week in the life of Jans, you know, trying to become a better poker player, maybe back then or now. How how does that look? You already said Monday is recovery day, and yeah. then you play what two, three times a week? Yeah, so uh like off off series, uh so let's say right now I would play um Sundays or always basically, whenever I can help it, and then I usually play Tuesdays. And maybe Thursdays, although like Thursday right now is a little bit of the it's the progressive knockout day. So like most of the big like the one case and everything is progressive knockout, and don't really I'm not really a big fan of this format. So I, if I can help it, I, I don't play these. Uh, I don't play Thursdays, but yeah, then Tuesday uh, usually Mondays. Uh, like some tournaments are are, are two day tournaments, so like Mondays is uh, usually a day that I grind as well. So like I think two three days in a week uh if it's not if there's nothing special running uh into the series and then basically um yeah i'm pretty uh like after my grind i, I spent like one or two hours setting up sims basically so like for for basically all the interesting spots that i had so the sims can run overnight and then like whenever i wake up i have breakfast 
uh, and I'll just go through the sims and then run whatever amount of additional sims still and like do some more specific like uh, focus studying on certain spots that I think you can improve on so yeah that's I think that's kind of what my week looks like and then like on days that I don't grind let's say um yeah like for example Friday or something I try to do something fun like play football uh go to dinner go out something like this um so yeah that's that's roughly uh, what it looks like but that, yeah like the basically the way my process works like I play a session I have a lot of st stuff noted from the session, especially hands, like uh, certain spots that I want to improve on. Um, yeah, and, and it's not always uh, great. Like sometimes when you when you play until pretty late, because obviously, yeah, in tournaments, you kind of forced to play uh, at night. And then I'm very bad at just leaving the computer and going to bed. I always have to like set some like set up some sims, like check up on some spots, like and then this usually takes at least a few hours. So if you grind until pretty late, like sometimes this means going to bed really, really late. So I try to improve that a little bit. Like also for your general health, I think it's good to be very consistent with the time you go to bed. So I, I try to not go to bed later than like, let's say 4 a.m. But yeah, if you play until 4 a.m. and you still have, I don't know, 15 sims to run, it usually takes like one and a half, two hours. And then, yeah, it's uh, it's not always great. So I try to avoid that, but yeah, I think this process for me works pretty nicely. Like, so I try to set up the Sims um, after my session it's immediately. Next day, first thing after having breakfast, I go through these and then uh, and then I study whatever else I think uh, I need to focus on in the, in the few hours that are left. And then if there's not a session, uh, yeah, I mean, there's not that much time left because usually most of my afternoon, yeah, you know, besides maybe going out for groceries or going out for a walk or doing something with my girlfriend is spent on studying and then um, and then a session again. And, and if I don't play a session, then I, in the evening, usually I do something with my girlfriend. I think you mentioned earlier as well, the closing things off. I think this, again, falls in that trend, right? You close off the, the your, your grind by everything that you have doubts about. You try to look up. Next day, you process this and then sort of it's it's done. You know, there's no uncertainties building up or etc cetera, etc cetera. and then every session you can start sort of fresh again which i think is a very good skill to not bring a lot of uncertainties or tilt or whatever uh to your next session so yeah, it's, it's a very very good feeling uh because usually i, I i'm a little bit bad at uh like I, I save too many spots usually to to run through but sometimes you you hit this uh this point where you run all the spots that you saved from the previous session and then it, it really i mean it's rare because i i, I save too much of them but yeah like uh, it, it really feels very good if you start your next session having run all your all all the sims that you wanted to run right and you feel completely like you, ha you have complete closure from this previous session like you've improved on all spots that you thought you could improve on uh and then you're ready for the next one and i mean on uh, i i usually manage to do this when um uh, when I don't play the next day, but if I if I have the two days that I uh, consecutive days that I play, it, you, I usually don't uh, don't succeed in this. But if I do, it it, it always feels it feels very good. So. I think it was Goosecore in the pot that as well said no session is played before the previous session is reviewed. It's kind of uh, reviewed. It's kind of along the same lines, and yeah. I, I would say I do exactly the same. Like I have certain focus points. It depends how much hands that I played in the session but after the session i will always review i will run like some specific filters like okay these are some spots that i'm focused on uh i'll run a filter that i made for that specific spot oh uh, flop goes check check how did i construct my betting ranges in this spot for example is a spot that i currently have in my post session filter it goes check check and i want to kind of look out uh on like some possibilities in this node so those are then spots that i review and then also what i think really helps i basically then base how i did my session based on did I execute my focus points, not on how was the dollar results over this insignificant sample. So I can have lost a lot of money, but then I review my focus points like, hey, I nailed all my focus points. So I still feel good about my session in a way. And again, that so if you feel good, you can sort of close the session and start a new session fresh. I think that's actually a very good skill. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is what I try to do as well. And uh, it, uh, I think it works, works uh, very well to do it like this, yeah. How does it then change if there's, for example, a series? How does your your because the series is quite intense. You you might sometimes play every yeah. day, basically. 
Yeah, so um, I mean, the, the way back in the day it was, it basically was uh, scheduled for every day. Thank God nowadays, uh, Fridays are days off. So like, or at least for um, for Scoop, uh, they started doing this, I think two years ago or something, maybe three years ago, where they said, okay, we, uh, after listening to fa uh, player feedback, like let's have one day off where there's no, or, I mean, I mean they, they, there will be some events, but nothing, nothing high stakes or like nothing with a big guarantee or something like this. So at least you have one, fixed day a week off, which is pretty good. So you don't get the FOMO uh, of having to take a day off when there's still stuff running, you know? Um, but yeah, uh, during during big series, like obviously a lot more time goes into playing compared to other weeks. So you have less time for studying. Like you don't, let, if you basically don't have off days and I mean, on, on the Friday, I don't play, I don't, I, I'm not gonna study many hours because I just wanna, this one day a week that I don't play, I, I definitely wanna do something other than something poker related so usually I, I would still my process would still look something like what i described but it it's just less hours for studying because if you play every day that means you go to bed later every day like yeah also these series events usually long uh run longer so you have you have fewer hours uh per day that you can focus on studying but that's what i why i try to um study a little bit more usually before series like really try to get all the details right or like not have any doubts of any parts of my strategy and then go into the series feeling very well prepared. So um, yeah, and then after the series, there's a process of like, there's a lot of leftover um, spots you need, you want to go through, for example, and then you take some more time for that. So, but yeah, usually uh, the, the study hours are, yeah, at least uh, comparatively to the, to the playing hours, uh, a lot, a lot less during a big series. Yeah, you, uh, you, you review more after the series is done. It's like you see it more as one long grind, basically. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, there's still obviously some studying in between. And, and, and you will also like, um, because everyone is playing actively in that period. So like you do get a lot of feedback from others, for example, like talk through hands, maybe a little bit more, but like the specific studying you do on your own, that's, that's definitely something that happens a lot less. You just don't have the time uh, when big series are running. You mentioned studying a lot. Uh, obviously, studying has evolved. I know, I mean, if you started 15 years ago, that was basically pre-solver area. Now we live in post-solver area. Yeah. Uh, how did, what kind of impact did the introduction of solvers have on your game? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because I th I, like nowadays I would consider myself like a pretty theory-based player or uh, yeah, like not, I don't really have any massive exploits that I try to execute or I don't, I don't really deviate that much. Like obviously certain amount, but not, not anything crazy. Like there are certain players that that very elite players that do that way more. Um, but yeah, back in the day, I, I think it used to be way more. Um, I mean, everyone was kind of a field player back then, but I guess most of what I did was based on either stuff that I learned off the table from like, you know, forums and, and videos. And then also just having a pretty good feel for, uh, for the player pool. And, and this is, I think, a skill that you can only develop if you play a, big, a high volume. Um, so yeah, I would just play a lot, um, try to pick up some things from these, uh, you know, whatever study material there was, and then really try to um, have a good feel for how to how to play pool plays and and try to, uh, yeah, you know, like kind of exploit them, I guess, in, in in that sense. And nowadays, it's it's a little bit different. Like it's more like having a very very good. Um, yeah, like fundamental strategy. And then wherever you think there's room for it, you you will deviate a little bit, but that's kind of my, my approach now. So I guess solvers play the huge role in that, like the shift from that one strategy to, to the other strategy is, it, it wouldn't have happened if, if solvers weren't around. And yeah, I, I think in general, like it's it's probably not a good thing for poker that solvers, solvers uh, exist. Like I, I think that the game would be probably more fun or, yeah, it would it would definitely be better, I think, if, if solvers uh, never made their appearance. But yeah, once they are there, you have to use them because it's just such a great tool to improve. So yeah, I think I think nowadays if you don't use them, it's uh, you you, I, you can still reach high stakes if you're lucky or you're some insane talent at, at poker or uh, exploring the pool or something. But I think uh, it's very hard to if you don't use them. Yeah, I think also like the idea behind strategy kind of changed, right? Back then. I mean, I could talk for myself as well. You know, you had like some tricks, some adjustments, but you didn't really think about like a glo executing a global solid strategy 
like ba basically those were kind of things that I personally wasn't really thinking about. I was just always looking at my opponents, what are they up to, and I try to figure out you know what they're up to and try to yeah, play play my hands correctly versus them sort of in a vacuum. I wasn't yeah. really thinking about an overall bigger picture type of strategy. And that's definitely that the solver has made me realize the and see see the value of. Do you remember still one of your biggest aha moments when you started to work with a solver where it's like, oh, that's how it actually works. I'm sure also there were many, or at least that's what I experienced when I started to work with solvers, many things that I was already doing, a solver was also doing. Like it's not like pre-solve area that players that were playing we knew a lot of, we understood intuitively a lot of things that a solver in the end was also doing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think I guess mostly, um, maybe maybe uh, in terms of bet sizes, like it, it really opened my eyes, I guess, to the possibility of, of a lot of bet sizes. Like I think before solvers, I was kind of stuck with like, oh, you just bet one third or two thirds or something, you know, like uh, it, I think solvers opened my eyes to to the possibility of over bets and min bets and, you know leads and all this kind of stuff like that you don't really that, that is kind of kind of a, a lot of hard harder to come up with um on your own so i think i think that's probably the one thing that i would name but i cannot really remember like a single aha moment that where i was like wow this is this is sick or like this and now i understand it or something it, maybe it, it it has happened and i just forgot about it but at, at least it didn't uh didn't stuck uh, stuck with me for me i i remember definitely like you said the and up until today basically as, as long as you give the solver a small a small enough sizing it will start betting it at some point that's usually like the oh, the overall trend but i remember the first like introduction of like smaller bets everywhere and in on basically all streets that was definitely something that was way more uh eye-opening for me personally like oh wow and the betting volume and smaller bets. I remember that was definitely some things that... Uh, I guess maybe uh, also re like responses to very small bets. Um, yeah, yeah, like versus really small bet sizes, solvers just don't fold much at all, right? And this, I, I guess if uh, you could call this an aha moment, where you, if you look at these kind of responses versus like small leads, for example, or like min bets, and you're like, wow, this... I, I, like every single player in the pool would miss like half of these combos. They would just overfold so massively. So I guess so solvers make you, make you think about that kind of um, yeah these possibilities, right? Because it, then it would mean if you execute just these strategies and people overfold so massively, you gain so much EV in these spots, right? So I, I guess those kind of things are uh, are really the things that uh, that stood out for me initially with solvers. Yeah, I remember in the podcast we did with Yuri, I also said solvers didn't necessarily open my eyes for how to play or at least you know in terms of copying what the solver is doing but it actually opened my eyes at how much things are actually not not gto and what actually the correct exploitative adjustment would be so he didn't start to play more gto he actually started to exploit way more did it yeah. take you a little bit of time i remember when solvers first came out like all the way in the beginning i was a bit hesitant you know, it was like, ah, oh, GTO, Pop Mike Boot doesn't play GTO, the, the, the classic one. So it definitely took me a little a little bit of time and a yeah. little bit of losing money before I was like, maybe I should look into the solver type of stuff. Yeah, for me as well. And and also because I, I've i never been uh, very tech savvy. So like, uh, yeah, like getting, uh, working with new software is not, uh, I'm not really that good at it, I would say. So it also, it doesn't spark an immediate interest for me, right? And, mm -hmm. and back then, uh, it, it wasn't immediately clear how big of a thing solvers would be. Uh, I remember that I, I did a study session, I think it was um, with a uh, Polish rack that I knew from Livestops. And um, and he sh showed me like, you know, a fire solver. And, and I, I remember like at first it didn't really, I mean, I, I thought, okay, nice program, like sure, whatever. And I, I think even the probably weeks or months after I didn't really bother using it. And then obviously at some point you start hearing more and more and more about it. So I, I, back then I definitely wasn't an early adopter. And I think that that's why nowadays when there's new software coming out, like, you know, three ways, software for three way or something or whatever new stuff, I, I try to use it as quickly as I can because, you know, as you, it, could, it could be the next big breakthrough in terms of strategy software, right? So um adapting early nowadays could be worth a lot of money i think so I, I try to be on top of these things a little bit more than i than i used to be back then so be on top of all the ai stuff releasing oh, very yeah. soon AI, AI, AI solvers are now becoming a thing which is pretty scary i think especially for uh yesterday uh 
looks a little bit at uh, rules and I yeah these AI servers are are pretty scary I think for uh, especially for cash. Uh oh, switch yeah. to tournaments. To be I, fair, I, I find I, tournaments I, I a here, nicer but... format of poker anyway. Not necessarily to grind, but more. I I think it has more. It has so much more aspects to make the game fun. Like if I would be a recreational, I would always play a tournament. I would not play a cash game. Yeah, that, that's why I think tournaments have uh, are, are going to be around for longer. It, no, it longevity just, is huge. Yeah, it, it attracts regulars more, and it's just way harder to cheat effectively, I think, in tournaments. Um, it's also just it's way harder to get really good at. Yeah, nah, I, uh, yeah, well, you could debate about that. Like, getting to the, I mean, if you would have to try right now to get to the top of cash games or to the top of tournaments, I mean, there's just so much more variance in tournaments. So, I, I guess, and you could never really say if you're the top dog in tournaments because no one, like, no how, one would, how would you even define that? The cash is pretty easy. Like, whoever is open sitting 100k, yeah, and, whoever uh, doesn't want to play someone else, yeah, 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 exactly. Like, it's pretty clear, but um, but in tournaments, it's not so clear at all. Like it's not that someone is sit, open sitting the hundred k main and tried and the table doesn't feel like this. That just doesn't happen, right? So, um, yeah, it, I don't know. But I, I would think purely in terms of technical skill, yeah, I, I don't know which one is harder. Like there's certainly more, way more uh, nuances maybe to or like different nuances to MTTs. But cash is like the general level of the, the top players in cash is like really really high. I think so. I don't know. Yeah, I remember Kudinov. I he, he said. Uh, MTTs are broader, but cash was deeper, he said, or at least that's how he described it. I, th I thought that, that made a lot of a, sense. That could be a pretty. You can pretty be way more accurate in cash, given that the variables are usually the same in terms of stack size ranges. Yeah, but uh, it's interesting because I used to think um, that tournament players who, or sorry, cash players who who play tournaments sometimes, like let's you know, some cash players would show up for big scoops on this or something. I always used to think like, okay, these guys probably crush tournaments pretty hard because the, the pool is just that much softer, right? If you have a, if you have good fundamentals, you're going to crush. But I, I've really turned around on that a little bit uh, recently because, and especially like if you if you play like, for example, these Trident builds, there's a bunch of, I mean, I know some of these cash guys and like they are very lost uh, when, when sex are short. And when ICM is a thing, like they're just punting around. And I mean, and they know they are, like they, it's not like they, they claim to be the best at that, but I think the edge that you get from this, and especially because the stakes are so much higher when you're deep in the tournament compared to the early levels where they have the biggest win rate. Like I don't, I don't, I, I've never played a Titan from the start with two on the big blinds because I know I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna win much there if anything. But I know I'm pretty good at like the short sex stuff and the ICM stuff, so it makes way more sense for me to wait for that period of the, of the tournament, right? And that's where the money is made, right? That's, that's when the stake, you play effective stakes that are so high that it really matters a lot more how you do there compared to the early stage. So I, I really came around on that thought that, that tournament players can, can always do well in cash. However, I do think if a tournament player puts puts a lot of, or like a, not even a lot, like a little bit of effort and, and studying time towards getting better at short stack and getting better at ICM, um, especially short stack, like it's it's pretty solved and like it's not that hard. ICM is, has a lot of nuances and it's, it's it can be a little bit counterintuitive. But I think if you get enough reps in, you can definitely improve very quickly. The learning curve is pretty steep, I think. So yeah, I I I, I would hope that the, the cash guys uh, don't all start doing that because then uh, tribes be would become a lot harder. But uh, yeah, I think I think nowadays a lot of cash guys kind of show up for tribe tournaments. They they're still winning in fields usually. I think not. Not all of them, and not all not all fields, but uh, but they could be winning a lot more. I think if they put like let's say a few hours a week extra and just studying uh, studying tournaments. But um, yeah, I, I will. I imagine this is going to happen at some point that the people start a little bit putting in a little bit more effort into their tournament game, the the high stakes cash guys, and especially uh, when the high stakes cash is drying up. Uh, you know, like this is a trend that seems to be uh, going on right now. So I think it's a bit. Uh... Hmm. I don't know what's the right word. I want to say cocky, disrespectful, or I don't know. I don't know what the right word is, but as a cash game player, to just hop in a Triton without, you know, having done some work in like, oh, let, let me see what happens if I don't have 100 big blinds, you know? No, I mean, yeah, don't get me wrong. They they they're, they try to improve, but um, yeah, I don't know if it's cocky. Like there, there's there's so many recreationals that play them that, you know, it, it's, it's, it could still be very plus EV. So there's also... You could also argue that there's no reason to not play them, but yeah, like 
I, I think at some point they're they're gonna make a, a more more of an effort to to improve at the ICM and short sex stuff, and then then they're gonna be really dangerous place because they're gonna they're gonna be so good post flop, right? There's no way I'm ever gonna be better than the high six cash guys at post flop. Like I don't see how that's ever gonna happen. So. Once they start beating me at ICM, then it's it's gonna be uh, lights out for me, I think. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. Like, it's not like you have to. Re it's not like you have to relearn poker. It's just like you have to re rethink about like, okay, how do the uh, how do my mechanics of how I understand poker, how do they transition to shorter stack play? Like, what are like the main heuristics that change? You know, when we're not hundred, but when we're 40, 30, 20, 10, uh, some ICM uh, stuff involved. I actually played. Uh, managed to somehow play a final table not that recently it was last summer in a tournament that i played here in malta and then i and then i reviewed it uh, together with a tournament play and i definitely had some wrong ideas basically i remember they were explaining me the the concept of that i shouldn't play hands because that makes more money than i do play hands yeah, folding, folding makes money that concept is well. yeah it's, yeah it's I, I remember actually the first time i think actually there was a hand the first time I heard about this concept was yours explaining it to me. It was a hand that you played, I think, on the MCOP 10K, where basically you opened the cutoff or something, and I think you were uh, big stack, yours was big stack, and then yours folded a stand off, and he folded because there were shorties behind, and then basically by folding, it would make it way more likely that they would make a light shove and bust, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a, this is an actual thing, and and I, I guess if you come from a cash background, this is not this is not something that is very easy to to wrap your head around. Like, oh, I I fold, so I make money. But yeah, if 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 the probability of someone else busting goes up, and you can make a pay jump, then yes, in a lot of instances, this is this is. Yeah, I, I was making like some opens, and then he was like, "Why are you opening this hand? You should just fold because there's two shorties there, and if you open, they only go all in with the X percent. Whereas if you fold, they might jam. I don't know how many percent." And then yeah. the chances of someone busting, someone busting is always good for you, especially because I was not the chip leader. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> reviewing it, I made, I made a lot of mistakes. But my mother was always, well, if ECM starts to matter, that means I already made the money. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is obviously well, that's, that's, not a, that's not a mindset that, uh, that, that's not going to get you very far. Uh, no, 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 I agree. I probably, I, if I would play more MTTs, I probably need, to, I need, I need an improvement. And yeah. if I want improvement, to get to my next point. Actually, thank you for uh, for replying to this question. This was actually a question that I had written down, like mistakes that cash game players make when they play MTTs. So you were, oh, you were ahead of me there. If I then need coaching, you know, I can knock on your door. You've coached a lot. You mentioned Bit B already. I think yeah. nowadays you also do uh, coaching for CNC, if I'm not mistaken. Right. I'm curious to, to know what would be, what are like some common leaks that you see in students who, who knock on your door for coaching? What are like very common leaks that you see players have? Um, yeah, so a small disclaimer, I, like one-on-one -on -one coaching, I don't do that much anymore. I, I just, um, I mean, I've, I've done a lot over the years, but I, I, I started enjoying like improving myself a little bit more than I started, to, uh, than I enjoyed teaching others so i, I really uh, like volume wise in terms of coaching i, I haven't done that much uh, like last year or something um but yeah i mean obviously I've, i still have a pretty good idea like i guess if someone would come to me right now i mean in entity still a, a lot of people are just way too passive or folding too much um yeah i mean and it's very hard to not fall too much, I guess, uh, especially in uh, chip EV MTTs, like you just get to be picked quite a lot. But yeah, th this is the most common, uh, I would say for mid stakes, low stakes racks, just being way too passive and being, uh, and just falling too much. This is this is the biggest leak. And I, I, I don't know if that's in cash also. The, the yeah, case. I was gonna say, this is, uh, this is exactly the same. If you would look at cash trends from lower limits to higher limits, the lower you go, the more they fall, the less aggressive they are. And the higher you go, the less they fall, and the more aggressive they become. Yeah, this is this is roughly the same, I think, in entities. And then, um, yeah, I, I, th I think, and, and recently, uh, people have really improved in that area. But I think ICM-wise, um, like, a lot of people have, have huge leaks. And, and this, again, this is actually one of the mo mo more expensive leaks that you can have because you play, on Final Tales, you play the highest stakes you, could, you, you can play in your games in entities. So if you make small mistakes even there, it's going to cost you so much more um, than like some tiny mistake that you make in the beginning of a tournament in GPV. So uh, yeah, I would always I would always recommend 
really focus on your your late stage um, play and, and try to really uh, optimize that first uh, if you're already at a certain level uh, early stage because yeah it's just like in the other day you just want to improve in the areas that that um, you know are going to improve your hourly the most and I think it makes sense to focus on whenever the stakes are highest uh, and improve there. I remember was it maybe Fader talking about this once, like in terms of putting in volume in terms of your heads up play. Where I don't know how did, how MTT players think about this now, but especially if you play shorter fields, like heads up is where you play for quite a lot of money. Where in the past there was more of a mindset, well, you know, heads up, yeah, I'll figure it out as you go. Is that, for example, something that you put a lot of time in as well? Um, well, I wouldn't say a lot of time, but like for example, um, before I went to Triton, I uh, I ran all the heads up ranges for big blind anti because it's so much different, right? Like you play full anti, whereas online you play, you know. Uh, a uh, very small anti compared to a uh, big blind anti. So I, I ran those ranges and I, I looked at the differences. Like, uh, and it is funny that I got heads up twice. <laughs> like, uh, I, I remember running these ranges and even telling my uh, friend that I was going with, like, oh yeah, I will run some, uh, you know, big blind, big blind uh, anti heads up range. And he's like, okay, yeah, uh, I mean, for what? So I have a 30k. I was like, yeah, you, know, you never know, right? Like, I might as well. And then obviously, I got heads up twice, which is pretty insane. Uh, but I think, like, with heads up, there's some. The thing is, like, very often, for example, um, uh, deals occur, especially in, uh, yeah, if, if you're heads up or if you're shorthanded with a few racks, especially heads up, this is where it doesn't matter anymore whoever has a chip lead, right? Like ICM wise, it, ICM is, it stops when, when 300 play stops. So I think if you're heads up with a rack, it usually makes sense, from, even if someone has this very tiny edge, to just make the deal from a variance point of view. Um, so I think that already diminishes the amount of heads up, like let's say on average, like maybe half of them are dealt or something that already eliminates half of the heads ups that you play for any significant amount. And then, um, yeah, I, I think, I do think you, uh, you can, you can, yeah, the learning curve is pretty steep, but then also like, it's so rare that you play heads up, like playing a final table or playing down to like three, four handed is very common, but getting heads up is, is pretty rare even if you play high volume um so yeah i would i would you, the way i approach it is basically i try to uh, know the ranges pretty well i, I obviously ran some stuff for for post love as well i try to like have a pretty decent grasp of the the general concepts but i don't study this for many hours uh like or it makes not, sense and for not a good part reason of study routine basically um so yeah and and whenever i i enter a different format like live uh, high stakes live program i yeah, then I would like to know a little bit of what's going on. And I'm glad that I did it. I'm, I'm not sure if it made any difference because, um, yeah, probably it made a little bit of a difference. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's good to, and if it costs you like one, two hours, it's definitely worth it, uh, probably. But I think any any time beyond that, so you would have to put in a lot more hours for, for small incremental improvements. I don't think this would pay off for tournament players to uh, to look into us up too much, and unless you start, especially if you play bigger fields, right? The smaller yeah, your fields are, very small fields. Like the Trident fields are still pretty big. Like on average, I'm not sure how often I would go heads up there during this trip, but probably very, very rarely, right? That yeah. happens twice. Is obviously some unicorn event that that is yeah, it's never supposed to happen. So I, I think um, yeah, it, it makes the most sense, and and this. I, I guess this is kind of an important important thing if you're if you're playing poker full time, you want to spend most of your study time on stuff that actually improves your hourly. And I think a lot of people just spend way too much time on stuff, like for example, people love to to tack like huge hands that they play, like huge pots, four bet, five bet pots, whatever, like triple barrel in a four bet pot. Like this is not a spot. This is a spot you play once a month. This is not going to help you at all. This is not going to help your win rate. It's not going to help your hourly to know what combo to triple barrel in a format bot. Like you want to spend your study time as effectively as possible. So you want to uh, study the spots that come up a lot that are worth a lot. And, and a lot of people, I, I'm sometimes mind blown by what, what kind of stuff people study and spend a lot of time on uh, that is not helping their, their bottom line at all. Um, so th this is this would be a big big thing that I would uh, try, to, try to tell people that I coach like, try to spend your study time very effectively and, and don't spend it on stuff that you don't need that you're never going to need basically yeah so either frequent spot or a high return like for example you were explaining icm yeah exactly so yeah. in for example and I think it was ben is... Heath was talking about preflop a lot right so in tournaments obviously preflop matter you shouldn't tolerate 
small mistakes there, I guess. I, I think I think if I uh, if I would have to take a guess about my study time, it's like eighty percent pre flop, maybe twenty percent post flop, something like this. Wow. Uh, because yeah, like. And yeah. then within that 80%, there's also a pre-flop ICM, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you have way more pre-flop decisions uh than post-flop decisions. Um, that's just the design of the game. And I imagine my, my, like, my study is like 99%, 1%. 99% yeah, post-flop, 1% pre-flop. Yeah, it's completely the other way around. Because and, and I think if you always play 100 big blind chippy V, it makes sense at some point you just there's there's nothing more to learn about pre-flop ranges. Like there's it's they're just set in stone, kind of mm -hmm. right now. Maybe like here and there, like if the recreational comes in the game, it's different or something. Yeah, like obviously, that. you know, there's like some some adjustments you make, and even right. in cash as well, you know, some people buy in short, you have short tables, so and then sometimes people are 20 BB, 40 BB. Yeah. You know, th there are some basic things, but it's again in terms of frequency, it's not frequent enough for me to, you know, go dedicate more time than necessary. I know the adjustments, I know roughly what the stack of ranges would be. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and for uh, for MTTs, I think it's kind of the other way around. Like you still play a lot of uh, post flop, but most of your important decisions, uh, and especially ICM related decisions, like in ICM, you you basically never see a flop. Like it, this is why final tables are not a lot of fun to reel. Like it's just a guy raising and a guy shopping, and and you know there's no there's no basically no showdowns. There's 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 basically no interesting uh, post flop plots, especially uh, because like a lot of everyone's volume is, is on GG. The structures are very fast. Uh, when stacks are shorter, obviously it, it takes away a lot of the postal play. So it, it's not a very fun railing experience, I guess, in that regard. Um, but yeah, it also means that you you should focus your study on, on pre-flop, I think, because that's and even just... post po, po, even if they go post-flop, playing post-flop ECM is also not fireworks. May, but, maybe from one side. It's hard, it, well, there's still, there's still uh, it's still like a lot different than uh, Chippy V post-flop, but um, and, and that's definitely, I guess, an area that uh, that a lot, a lot of people are understudied uh, in, like post op ICM. But um, but yeah, it doesn't happen so often. So it also makes sense, I think, that people don't study it that often because it's just really, yeah, you have so many more pre flop decisions than post op decisions in uh, in entities. All right. So we have ICM. People are too passive and too foldy, so AKA become less risk averse. Well, good good luck with that also from like a, a mental game side. Maybe yeah. Anu can hop in here in a second to, to see how we can help players with that. Then we have, you know, studying spots that are actual EV, so frequent and, you know, that actually make you a lot of money like ICM. And then the last point I got actually from your, from your Twitter feed, great Twitter feed, by the way, you got a good Twitter game. Definitely yeah. recommend following Jans over there. You, you tweeted saying, let me just size exactly what my hand is worth. Quoted every empty, every empty T rack. Yeah. Well, this no, is that's probably league number four then. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. But this is just a big, I, I guess it's just a player pool uh, league. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the same in cash or at. Yeah, it's up, the same. It's to a certain same. level in cash. Um, but yeah. And, and sometimes uh, I try to try to not do this anymore, but. I've I've been many times in a situation where someone bets a river and you just like I just I could just like pinpoint whatever he has like down to like a few combos right because it's just it's just the sizing like this he's just kind of giving away his hand strength and you still call your whatever middle pair because you just to confirm your read and then obviously had that and I I really try to make a conscious effort like to not do that anymore if I if I think I'm very yeah this is kind of more it's also like the, the theory versus a deviating uh, debate, right? Like I, I nowadays I, I really try to take the deviation route and just fold there because I know I'm supposed to call and but I know he he's always going to have this certain hand group. Uh, and I think these reads, as if you play high volume, if you if you play for a very long time, you get a really really good feel for these kind of reads and situations. And that's not that that's something that's not transferable. I think like you cannot teach that to someone. And I think it's it's a it can be a pretty big part. Like I, I'm not sure how big part how big of a part of my game that is exactly, but I think it's a pretty big part. And and I, I think maybe people underestimate that a little bit, like because they expect you like if people hire me as a coach, for example, like they would love that I could just like kind of teach them how I play and that's and they can execute that as well or something like this, right? That's obviously not how it works. Partly because yeah, like you build up a feeling for the game or like a feeling for how the pool plays over a long time and by playing very regularly and and that's not something that that you can transfer onto someone else i think very easily so um yeah I, and i and i try to uh to, 
to do that a little bit more uh, like really you know just make it disrespectful fold up i think a guy just sizes his hand and he's just gonna have a certain certain uh, very specific range i mean i think it's important that you start your decision making process at a point that people often forget to think about which is what is the quality of my opponent because if your opponent usually people who are more transparent like that they're not going to be at a certain elite level so then yeah. obviously more deviation type of plays will be often more correct basically the stronger your opponent the more you follow uh like theory and gto and the weaker your opponent the more you start to deviate once you have the information right that's kind yeah. of how it works so when you say for example that nowadays you play close to gto well that's probably also because nowadays your opponents are playing close to gto so there's simply wow. less room in terms of messing around hope, exploitative yeah. you're, you're 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 just basically torching money yeah i wouldn't say i, would, I play close close to gto i mean i would i would uh, an attempt to love it if that was the case but i i, I would I, I i hope i play somewhat close to the version of gto that i know obviously it's like playing close to real gto i think it was still very far away luckily um but yeah what you said is true yeah i definitely so if, for example you you compete in the in in very tough fields already and you were mentioning that you know you're taking some shots or at least you're also playing a lot of 10ks regularly what what are european sets like those guys so let's say 10k rex or even 5k plus rex what sets them apart from like 1k rex why are the high six rec tougher to play against then is it for example because they're less transparent with their bet sizing you cannot just pinpoint them on a hand they don't i mean they, they they don't give you easy decisions like that i think most of them are just extremely lucky to be honest <laughs> no, uh, uh, some of them some of them definitely uh i mean uh like if you look at the, the the 10k player pool like some of them like most of them are very very good and then some of them are there because they are on a heater or you know like this uh, this is the beauty of entities uh, but I would say this is part of the ecosystem, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I would say what sets them apart? I think, um, yeah, just general aggressiveness. Like I, I think, yeah, if you if you compare playing a uh, hundred dollars or to ten k, yeah, you the general play is just a lot more passive. It's just a lot more calling. Like you know, like in in ten k's, this everyone is just. Uh, decently aggressive like all the regulars at least so they put you in a lot more spots that are that are tough like you, you put you in a lot more tough decisions if i play some hundred dollar tournament i won't get a lot of tough decisions usually um so i guess that's kind of they, they, people fight for bots more it's it's just hard generally harder to win chips uh, i couldn't like pinpoint a very specific thing but like the general level of your of the, the regulars that, that play this these fields is just very high and then obviously they run or like they are beautiful because there's also a lot of amateurs in them uh, and especially on gg then specifically nowadays like this is basically the only side where on those kind of stakes a lot of uh recreational players make an appearance basically yeah i think good players always do the thing that you don't want them to do and for example when when yeah. lesser let, let's say less less quality players when they then are aggressive, you're not in a tough spot because they're never aggressive. So when they're aggressive, they usually have a good hand. So you just fold. It's it's a simple. It's it's when it's always always a sweet. So then you also have some guys who take aggression to a next level, and then it's just like yeah, I have a hand. So you know if you have it, you had it. So that's you're also no longer in a tough decision because it's just two aggro. Even though two aggro is usually harder to play against than two passive. I think yeah. I saw on 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 your Twitter wall. I saw I saw a, a picture. Says Adamo is bluffing every street again. What do we do? Fold free flop, fold flop, fold turn, and one guy said call down, and then someone oh, yeah. got angry. If I yeah, recall correctly, yeah. yeah. I well, that, uh, and this was uh, at Adamo's peak when he, I think he went on this massive. Um, was it last year or the year year before? Where he went on a, on like a massive heater when he won everything online and live basically in in a, in a year. Um, but yeah, like, and it's easy. It's obviously easy to say. Like you can you can just say. Uh, Oh yeah, why don't you just call down everything against? Because he's always bluffing. But if you're in the spot, and I fold against the diamond many times, like I, I'm guilty of this myself. But obviously, it's it's funny uh, to see to see other people fo folding to him, and then yeah, I mean, it's 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 funny to make fun of, and it's it's so apparent what his strategy is, but it works very well. And, and like, there's a reason. Like, he's a super smart guy, uh, and he's obviously thought about this. Like, how do I exploit the pool that I play in? And he found a very good way to do that by being hyper aggressive, and and it, at least for uh, for a long time it worked. I guess nowadays, like people are uh, adjusting a little bit more, but it 
I think he made the correct read that, that it takes a long time for a player pool to adjust to a strategy like that. And he, he really printed with that. I mean, obviously, he's, he's, he crushed these fields. So, yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's also very hard to adjust. If you give someone who overblows the river, you just fold zero. Even if you know someone is over aggressive, you don't fold yeah. zero. And then you're sitting you there with your bottom, it. yeah, you're sitting there with your bottom fan, like and, he, and Adama's all in for five x plot, and you're like, okay, I mean, you yeah. If, 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 if you would just afterwards, you note lock, he's like, oh, he's slightly over bluffing. Everything becomes a call. Yeah, you see, you should just always call down. But when you're in the situation, there's other things in taking consideration. Also, with very aggressive players, especially if you then, let's say, for example, you put it out this tweet. Then you, next time you play against a demo, you're like, a demo on my treat. Is he really going <laughs> to overbluff again against well, me? He knows I'm going to call him down. That's the thing. I, I, I don't think, I, I think he's pretty set in his uh, like aggressive ways. Like, and, and it's, yeah, that's also uh, admirable. Like he, he really just doesn't back down. He just keeps going for it. And uh, I mean, it worked out for him very well. I think, uh, yeah. So, but, but um, yeah, it was obviously also more of a joke. And I think, I think in general, like there's always, always some truth to it, of course. Like yeah, of I, course. At least I do think that this is, he's abusing people that are, are overfalling to him, but I'm one of them, of course. Like, I mean, it's, and, and if you're in the spot where he's all in for five X spot uh, on the river and you're sitting there with your bluff catcher. Yeah. Good luck calling. Like this is just, this is what he capitalizes on. Like how hard it is to, to actually call down in this spot. So yeah, it's, it's, I think it's very, uh, he's obviously a uh, sicko. And I mean, probably actually like a solver doesn't even, let's say you put his range into a solver and it says bottom pair as a call, blah, blah, blah. It still is not the complete picture. If you're, for example, in a very soft field, like there are some future game considerations, you probably, probably you, you might still not be able to call because that's probably what you think. Like, am I really going to risk, 5x my whole tournament life now with bottom pair while there's free fish at my table who I can just take the money from next hand. And this is probably something yeah. that he can then capitalize on. Yeah, but the thing, I don't know, with future edge, like if you have a very profitable calling spot, it's it's always going to be very, very hard to beat this with future edge, so to speak. Like if you can win whatever, 10 big blinds or something with a river call, like you're not going to win 10 big blinds every hand. Like, you know, like you just have to call. Yeah, and and but I think ICM is maybe a bigger factor in that. Like tournament life, obviously, is a, a thing, and Adamo keeps putting you to the test, also deep in tournaments. So, but that's so so that's more psychology. So it's nothing to do with the the EV. Uh, yeah, I think, increase I think of your call doesn't have to really be that high. It's, it's it's psychology. Yeah, yeah for sure. Right. And actually, the last question I had for you was uh, in terms of uh, life entities, as you nowadays also play life entities. Did you encounter any difficulty switching from online play to live? Did you have to make any adjustments? I saw on the final table you were rocking uh, a nice pair of black sunglasses. Yeah, yeah. Very so smooth. I mean, basically, before trying, I was thinking like, yeah, yeah. I like this is the highest I've played. Basically, uh, what uh, what am I gonna do to like increase my EV? Um, and one of them was, you know, no alcohol. Uh, and I thought, okay, I'm I'm gonna wear sunglasses, or at least when it matters, um, because who knows if it helps a little bit like with giving off tells or whatever because um yeah like i think for every other poker player as well at some point in my career charlie carroll told me he had a live read on me but he couldn't say what it was uh so yeah i mean I'm, I, I don't think it's true but like who knows right and if you can uh if you can avoid that kind of thing uh like it doesn't cost me anything to wear sunglasses wear, wear sunglasses so and especially for final tables by the way it was pretty nice with the uh, because the lights are pretty bright so I think it's uh, it was nice anyway for that, but uh, yeah, like these are the very small things that I think if you can increase your EV with by a very small margin, when you, when you play this high of stakes, it, it it could be a lot of it could be a significant amount of money. So I figured, um, yeah, th these were two things I did. Let's see if there was anything else. I mean, if I could, I would have gone to to Vietnam earlier. Um, actually, this is one thing that I, if I, if I'm doing something like this again, I would definitely do differently because I had someone visiting uh, Vienna uh, right before Triton, and I already planned this like months ago before I decided to go to uh, to Vietnam. So ideally, I would arrive three days earlier, get rid of my jet lag, and then start playing tournaments. And now it was just I came from the airport straight to the tournament area. I had 20 minutes left on late reg in the 15k. I reg it. I bust the second hand or something. I I, I re-enter and then I get second on the second bullet. I, I had no sleep. Not I mean, I, obviously it was a two-day tournament, so I got like a few hours of sleep. But and and I think for the whole week, I, on average, I maybe slept like four hours a night or something, maybe five. So 
that I mean that's that really influences the way you can execute and perform uh, in a big way. And I think I mean I I was lucky to get lucky, but I think I could have played better um, if I had eight hours uh, of sleep a night. And I think if I didn't have jet lag, I, I certainly could have done that. So this is something that I would definitely improve on next time if if I go to like a different time zone. I would I would just fly out way earlier. And in th in this sense, instance, I, I would have done it if I could, but I. Uh, unfortunately couldn't um, luckily i think a lot of players were in the same situation right it wasn't ept friends like right before stopped like one day before or something yeah well i would i would argue if you if you if you're playing a, or planning on playing a, a full trident schedule you just leave paris early because like ev wise it doesn't make any sense to play like some lower six journeys in paris fly to vietnam have a jet like yeah, yeah. Or playing like 25 k's and 50 k's and 100 k's so i don't know i think i think i yeah if you really if that's your main grind these tournaments then you should just go early i mean ben he said that as well on your podcast like yeah yeah was there a few days early which is the gto thing to do i think um ben heath very gto, GTO. i mean I, I really enjoyed that podcast really uh very insightful i told him i was like, sitting next to him i tried and i said like hey yeah uh, that was a nice uh nice he podcast. inspired you to come on in a way you yeah, know this uh, is like we, we talk about it if people <laughs> google Jan's irons only in dutch they might find some things but other than that you know this oh, is like I, your, I, actually your asked him, uh, I, I asked him like uh, about this and um and then he said like yeah you know initially i didn't want to do it but then at some point i realized like you know people are actually interested to hear what i have to say so why wouldn't i do it and that's why he decided to come on i think uh and, and that made me think like ah you know and then obviously i've been to journey and uh and you asked me i was like yeah okay let's let's do it then yeah to go to come back to the sunglass i think smart move right you don't know what you don't know so yeah and like i said what's the effort you you wear sunglasses that's it exactly. but other than that you're, you're not personally into uh you don't let life tell screw your decision making process. No, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever had even the remote possibility of of uh, of, of having a life tell. I've I've never even looked at someone and, and thought like, okay, that's you know that I can gain something from this. That's also because I I uh, I don't really focus on it, and maybe there's something to gain from that. I I, I imagine there's probably amateurs who give off decent decent life tells, um, but I I don't know. I feel like uh, it's also very very easy to go wrong and i've heard many examples of this as well from like you know friends that thought they had a lifestyle and, oh I, he was strong uh, anyway and i called down something ridiculous you know like this kind of stuff happen happens as well so i think it's also it's very easy to to think you you have some certain tell and, and you actually don't uh, and the way i approach a game is i try to play I, I approach it mostly from my own game or like my own range you know like uh like the technical side of it so I, I try to play a very solid strategy and i don't think live reads really play too big of a role in that um but yeah some people swear by it and I, I'm, not, I'm not a not a huge believer and i think if you can manage to not give off a lot a lot of lifestyles um then you're usually going to be going to be okay in these uh in these life fields yeah i saw a hand very recently where I think it was Helmut jamming in Jack Five offsuit against Pretrenchilo's aces. You, you have you have you seen that hand? Oh, I, and I, then I, he said, "Oops, thought I had a read." So that, you you telling this? Day, like, yeah, I saw a head recently. Someone said this to me. Uh, also, like Helmut said that about Pretrangelo. Yeah, so it was it was I think it was like a blind bet or something with Pretrangelo where Helmut raised big blind three bet and he just ripped in like Jack Six offsuit or something, and Pretrangelo just snapped with aces. And then yeah. Helmut was, "Oops, read was wrong." Yeah, I think no, it's I, had, also, I had to think about this one. I think it's also a little bit disrespectful to even claim that a guy who plays like nosebleed stakes for 10 plus years to even claim that you can have a read on a guy like this. Mm -hmm. Like this would basically mean that he's just giving away stuff. I mean, this is just, I mean, I, I think personally, uh, I don't think he actually had a read. I think he, he just wanted to go home. Well, I, I think it's for Helmut, like he has a certain brand, like may, it looks cool if it works, if it doesn't work, okay, whatever. Yeah, like, you oh, know. So, so you're, you're arguing that maybe this is long-term plus EV? Uh, well, for it. it take everything in consideration? Uh, for, for, for him, like he has a certain brand. Like I, I think if he, if he jumps yeah. there and, and the guy falls, I don't know, let's say king four off or something, he has, a, he, it's probably going to be, uh, you know, it, it's going to increase his brand, right? Like the value of his brand. Oh. So maybe, know, I mean, maybe maybe he's sure. he's la he's he's the last one laughing. We're all like, "What the idiot gem that is!" But he's he's not making a picture. I'm not sure if that's something that Helmut considers. Like maybe I'm actually actually overestimating him here. 
when I've seen a player, I, I don't feel like he makes these kind of considerations, but who knows, you know, like he's, like he did well for himself. So you got to respect the hustle, I guess. But he, I don't think he's a very good tournament player, to, to put it mildly. Actually, uh, a, a point that you, you mentioned in terms of uh, when I asked you about the life tells, you mentioned so you try to play more from like a strategy with the solver. I think this is also a point that uh, where people might misuse a solver or the power of a solver. They use solver or library of sims to look up a hand. So basically, you know, the player bounce and they look up the hand, but they're not using it to think about what is the strategy that I'm trying to play in a certain situation. I think this is actually a spot where people uh, definitely misuse or underutilize the power of a solver. Because I think from what it sounds like here, you use more a solver as like your assistant to build solid strategies in a certain spot that you can always just fall back on. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like your, your baseline, your, uh, that's your starting point. Like that's the fun fundament of your, of how, how I play. And then there's a lot of room for, yeah, adjustments, um, inter interpretation, this kind of thing. But like you have kind of like a certain uh, base layer from your strategy and this, I think it's very good to keep improving this layer uh, because that's that's kind of, you cannot fall uh, under, like lower than this layer. Like, like there's always a certain amount of level of play that you can have. And I think, uh, the higher this level is, uh, the better you're going to perform. And obviously, there's a lot of things, adjustments, etc., that are, come on top of that. But I think there should always be some kind of base of uh, just having a generally good fundamental understanding of the game. Yeah, I would say I experienced the same when I started to work with solvers. Like my C game improved, basically. Like you said, yeah, I couldn't true. fall lower than the the theoretical foundation that I laid. Exactly. Yeah. Adam. I mean, there's many questions that I could ask, but actually I wanted to ask you one thing that I personally then struggle with, and I, uh, Jans mentioned it as well, which is uh, jet lag or sleeping fatigue, especially when playing live tournaments. Uh, for example, then I remember a live tournament that I played, which actually was Master Classics, Amsterdam, uh, one of the few tournaments that I sometimes play. I remember I made day three, but that was accumulated two nights of very bad sleep because I find it very... First of all, normally I'm in bed at like 10, 11, and then suddenly we have to play until three. So mm -hmm. my brain is all confused and I'm laying in bed and cards are flying through my head and, and I, cannot, I cannot fall asleep. I sleep very light. Then the next day, you know, one night, okay. But then I remember the next day, I was also very unlucky. Like the fire alarm in my hotel went off twice. So I was like, what the fuck? So I had like only a couple hours of sleep and I'm playing a game that I'm not used to playing. So, you know, you were talking about this foundation. I definitely fell somewhere below that. We're playing live. At some point, I made some mistakes with throwing wrong chips in just from sleep fatigue. I didn't realize the blind level has already gone up. Uh, all that type of mistakes. So how can I, how can we, everyone, perform more optimally in live poker? I, I've tried around with, you know, you want to focus and then like right one hour or something before it stops to take like, not a sleeping pill, but you know, like some supplements to calm me down or something. But then again, in the last hour, then maybe I'm already getting a little bit foggy. I don't know. It's very hard to go from I need to be on the top of my game to let's go to sleep. Mm. Yeah, so a host of problems there. Uh, starting from bad schedule, lack of sleep, jet lag, low stress tolerance due to being fatigued. So uh, with all the problems you mentioned there, I think the most important variable was getting on routine and a oh. good sleep. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought you would just say not enter in the first place. Oh, but that, that's also that's also a solution. That's a, another another one. But yeah, I think getting on routine is a real big one. Obviously, uh, anyone traveling, jet lag is a big obstacle. Whether you find east or west, there's kind of different strategies to get optimally on the right sleep schedule. I think like you've talk, touched on in Ben Heath, there's like arriving two days, three days before to allow your body's clock to adjust is very sensible. Then, as you mentioned, switching off from poker becomes a challenge. I think uh, John's mentioned. Uh, like when he wins a tournament, it has a big MDT score. It's hard to switch off because you got that adrenaline pump in. So coming up with co coping mechanisms to uh, lower that adrenaline, allow yourself to um, unwind. Generally, going with some sort of walk when you've got adrenaline in your body, it's a heightened emotion. There's a lot of your physiology is activated. You want to use that to move the body to calm yourself. Often the mind's racing still with all the adrenaline in your, in your mind. So finding some way to kind of calm yourself down. Meditation works for some people, doesn't work very well for others. In that scenario, cold showers can work. I know for myself, if I've got things on my mind, having a cold shower, then a warm shower, like cold contrast is called, can ease your thoughts as well. Also journaling, if you've got lots in your mind, you can't sleep, mm -hmm. writing, them, writing things down so it gets out of your head. But yeah, then the main kind of variables you touched on, 
are all around scheduling. It's all around get on routine and be able to switch off in the, in the evenings and then wake up and be on schedule in the mornings. If that's chaotic, then you've got to realize, okay, in this current environment, I am at, I'm at a low tolerance level. My stress tolerance is very low. I had five hours sleep and things are going to annoy me more than usual. My emotional tolerance is going to be less. I'm going to make some erratic mistakes, most likely compared to usual. What can I do to uh, mitigate some of those? Taking more breaks, maybe not playing in the high buy-ins if you were down, down to that day. So uh, yeah, everything else becomes like damage limitation once the kind of schedule's being messed up, so to speak. Yeah, I guess aligning expectations is already quite big, right? Because then I was also kind of on tilt of the fact that I made all these mistakes, which, you know, I guess you could say were predict predictable. They could have happened. But then if my expectations were wrong, I was expecting myself to play well. Then I guess, you know, you kind of get tilt from tilt, sort of. There was a, there was a funny uh, moment in the, during Triton where uh, I made day two of the 100K with like, um, I think it was the 100K where, I don't know, I, I didn't have a good stack. But anyway, uh, like, I think it was the first hand, <laughs> like of day two, I was under the gun, I had king a2, so I had to like think, okay, do I want to open this or not? Like, look a little bit around at stacks and everything. And I decided to open and I, and I, I looked at the big blind and it was three chips. Um, I don't even know what I was thinking, but I raised, I think I raised to 7k or something. And, and the big one was actually 15k. So and everyone at the table was looking to me. I announced 7k and everyone was like, what, what is this guy talking about? And obviously I, I was operating on like, you know, five hours of sleep a night or something maximum. And, and at some point it gets you and you make these mistakes. And obviously I, like it's very costly in, in this. I ended up losing a big pot of lioness who was in the big, in the small line with fucking king three off and made, made two pair, uh, which wouldn't have happened if I just would have raised, right? So it's, it, it's really costly at these stakes these small things that change the way you execute can really end up uh, combining to like a big, um, you know, dollar uh, mistakes kind of in, like. In general, I would say also in tournaments, that's a very big difference with tournaments and cash. I think in cash game, you wake, you make way more money with your A game because, you know, you can, for example, play two hours, take a break, come back, try to play your A game again. Whereas in tournaments, it's such long days. Your C game, I think having a strong C game or like I said, in live tournaments, you're fatigued. I mean, Ben was also saying that in live stops, you know, he maybe sleeps like five hour a night. So I I would say C game makes you way more money in tournaments than it does in cash games. Yeah. Yeah. You just are forced to operate uh, on your C game from time to time. And uh, it's definitely worth a lot if your C game is at, at, a, at a certain level, especially uh, because it mostly happens, I think, during live tournaments because online. Yeah, like especially live, like you're sometimes just forced to play day twos on very little sleep, for example, and it's it's very high stakes. And if uh, if then the level you operate on is very low, it's gonna cost you a lot. In the yeah, and you play for what eight hours on average, maybe. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I play I play four hour, five hour sessions max, and then I'm completely fried. Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there's a, one of the reasons is that I don't like to play tournaments from start live is is obviously because I. It is not necessarily my field of, of expertise playing this deep, but I think the fatigue is definitely a big one. Like I tried and I, I late rush everything because, uh, and I just skipped at least like four or five levels because there's just not much reason. Like I'm going to be completely tired at the end when the stakes are highest and I'm going to make mistakes and they're going to cost me, or I can just like skip the first few levels. I'm not making much money in those anyway. Uh, rest a little bit, try to get my mind off of poker, like do whatever will help me to perform later. So uh, yeah, this this was really helpful for me, and I, I mean, especially with uh, being being on jet lag and not a lot of sleep, it was a no brainer. But I think in general, this approach suits me pretty well. Uh, but yeah, there are some other guys like uh, a lot of tried and regulars play everything from the start, um, and yeah, maybe they're just in better shape or like they're used to it. You know, like there's all kinds of reasons to to play from the start. Uh, but it's definitely um, a skill, I guess, that I don't uh, have yet to be able to do that. Yeah, very interesting. I, I haven't heard of um, late regen as like a fatigue management kind of strategy before. But yeah, it makes complete sense. Like, obviously, if you feel like your edge is late in the tournaments, you're a bit jet lagged going in. Why play like an extra three, four hours with your low edge? Then when it really matters, you're going to be like extra fatigued and it's going to have an impact there as well. So yeah, it uh, sounds like a no brainer in that scenario and a yeah, kind of smart strategy overall. There's obviously uh, exceptions, like when the field is exceptionally soft. Uh, then you might want to be in there from the start because you can win a lot. Um, yeah, like an EPT but, main event or something. Yeah, if, for example. But still, like I think this, I think a lot of people underestimate the fatigue factor. Like because EPTs run for five days, and on the fifth day when you play for a lot of money, obviously you don't get there very often on average. But when you do, it's very important to be 
in the best shape you can be like mentally physically whatever and uh, i think the hours add up um yeah so I, I don't know i think it's i think it's a factor that a lot of people don't really consider too much but i think uh, I, I thought about this and i, I think it might it makes it, it made sense for me to do it like this uh, during triton and it depends a little bit on, on different factors as well but I, I think it's not something that people think about uh, often enough in tournaments yeah, I agree. I've never heard it mentioned in the kind of fatigue management context. So yeah, it does make sense though, if you think of playing long hours, long days, the compounding effect of those extra hours, when the money really matters, how sharp you feel. If you feel like you've got great endurance and you're, that's kind of your skill set, then awesome play from the start. But any factors that have impacted that or it's not a kind of strength of yours to play the super long sessions, then yeah, play to your strengths and yeah, the late regen strategy and that scenario sounds sounds good. I guess Maybe also if you... <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Maybe I'm just old and not fit. And, and and everyone who listens to this is like, dude, come on, just sit down and start. What are you talking about? It could also be. But I mean, you, you have to find what works for you. And, and I feel like this uh, suit me, suits me pretty well. But it's also a thing, right? Online people who just usually max late rack as like an overall strategy. I guess also it saves you a part of the trick to study. If you just always late rack, you never have to study any deep spots. So, you know, yeah. half of the oh, trees no, are done. I mean, um, uh, yeah, this is, I think, uh, uh, like, a, this is a big part of online entities, uh, mainly because late reg is very often open for a long time. So this means uh, your stack has a certain ICM value because a lot of people are already busted. Um, so if you if you can reg, like, with 50% of the field already busted, your stack is just going to be worth more because you're going to be closer to the money. So that's why in a lot of instances, especially on GG, where the late reg is usually open for very long, uh, it, it's really worth a lot to get that late max late batch bullet in, and uh, obviously. So basically, the starting chips that you get for your buy-in is worth more than if you, if you yeah, late yeah. Yeah. Like there are certain ways you can estimate like the the worth of your stack, and uh, usually it's already like one point something x the the amount you bought in for automatically when you buy in. And even if you only have ten bigs, it doesn't matter. Like there's just certain ICM value that you can give to your stack that is worth more than your buy-in, and then it doesn't even count for like you know, edge or anything like that. Oh yeah, exactly. Because then edge, obviously the, the softer the field, like you said, the bigger the chances of you accumulating more chips that the, the average chip sec that you will have at the moment that late rec closes will have a higher EV. And then when the field gets less soft, so harder then that EV is probably greater. Yeah, but in, in live tournaments is a little bit less of a factor because uh, late reg is just not open that long uh, wow. compared to online usually. Uh, so yeah, the closer you are to in the money, the more this late reg strategy really becomes a, a thing. Um, and live, in, in life, it's just not really a thing. And I hope at some point online, it will also uh, become less of a thing uh, when sites start to realize it's just, because it's just not a lot of fun if like, you know, I don't know, like 50 guys join in the last second and, and everyone has 10 bigs. And like, it's just, that's not a very enjoyable, I think for amateurs, not a very enjoyable thing to have happened in, in their tournament that they play, right? Uh, so and it's also just kind of cheating the system a little bit. Um, so I, I yeah I, I hope they do something about this. But the sites also have an incentive to keep the late reg open for a long time because it means more players. More, more players. Um, yeah, giving people a long time to re-enter is just generating more rake. So I don't really see it changing unless they realize that it could mean have some effect on the ecosystem. But sites are generally not very good at that kind of thing. They just apparently you usually go for the quick ray grab i mean we see this now with gg and the, and the cash uh, environment so I, I i'm not very hopeful for that but who knows maybe maybe they change it up at some point so yeah yeah, so I'd like to do a few uh, reflection questions now. I know, be mindful of time. I know it's been quite a while already. But yeah, I'd like to look back on your career and see if we can get any wisdom or lessons that you've learned for the audience to to learn from. So uh, first question is, what would you say is the most important lesson poker has taught you, looking back on your career as a whole? Um, what's the most important? I guess for me personally, it would be that freedom is very important. What does freedom mean to you? Uh, well, yeah, just just uh, yeah, being very free in uh, in making your own decisions, like living the life, yeah, like in a way that you want to live it, uh, not having to answer to anybody, uh, that kind of thing. That that's what freedom means to me, and uh, that's what I appreciate. I think probably the most about my poker career. Have you always felt pokers give you freedom from the start, or has it been recently when you've been in a better financial situation that freedom's been apparent? 
Um, yeah, well, probably not from the very start, but as, as soon as I started to make like some serious money with it, yeah. So like I would say the last 10 years for sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any lessons you had to learn the hard way in your poker career? Um, hmm, that's a good one. Um, I cannot think of anything from the top of my mind. I, uh, I guess uh, live poker pays off in the end. <laughs> That definitely was uh, the hard way. It took me many years. <laughs> yeah, it took a while. Yeah. What would you say, in your opinion, is one of the most, or some of the most important skills or character traits for a poker player to develop? So uh, just to give a bit of segue on that, I think for yourself, you've obviously got good work ethic. You've got great emotional control. You don't, um, yeah, your, your stress tolerance seems very good. Any sort of traits you feel like, looking at other poker players, also looking at the poker player, poker market as a whole, are important traits to uh, to develop? Yeah, I mean, I think just general competitiveness, and uh, this is maybe not something you can really develop or teach, so I'm not sure how useful it is, but I think this is a good, very good trait to have. Um, other than that, I mean, yeah, like risk tolerance, I guess, is a big one as well that some people struggle with. Me included, by the way, I'm not, I don't think I'm a huge risk taker, but... Uh, yeah, I'm not sure where I exactly am on the spectrum, but that, that that's one that I, I would think is uh, is very good to be pretty risk tolerant. And then um, what else? Yeah, I mean, yeah, just try to uh, have, have, enjoy what you do and like try to organize your life in a way that you enjoy what you do and that you enjoy your day to day uh, process. And if I, I'm not sure if that's that's not necessarily a trade, but that's that's definitely very very important, I think. And uh, something that maybe some people struggle with. 100%, yeah. I think you can cultivate more curiosity, more learning, more enjoyment into your days, which changes your, your relationship with what you're doing. So yeah, it might not be a trade as such, but it's definitely a kind of approach you can uh, take into poker. So it's interesting risk tolerance. I think it's a very interesting perspective or thing to touch on for poker players because it does vary a lot from player to player. And I'm always interested how players improve their risk tolerance because from my perspective, most players going into poker don't have a very high risk tolerance. Maybe there's some exceptions who just like don't really care about money. They're just all, all the way through the career. They can take kind of, kind of big shots. But first, a lot of poker players, the, the money side at first becomes quite the scary parts of it. And it takes a while to build your tolerance to certain levels. So uh, for yourself, is there anything that you've done to build your risk tolerance or is there anything that you feel like helps with being able to tolerate more risk? Like for now, obviously you're playing the Triton series, you're going playing 30 Ks. Is there anything you've done in your career that's helped you to play uh, bigger tournaments? Well, actually quite recently I got more into, um, because I've never really uh, done much with bankroll management because I have I was always rolled from the start pre pretty comfortably. So it was never really an issue, but uh, like more recently I, I've been, um, uh educated a little bit more by, by friends uh, about like it's very important to size your your buy-ins correctly or like if you have a very good spot uh to make money you should you really put a big part of your bank into that right and so yeah it's just certain uh like you can basically estimate like how many buy-ins you need for certain tournaments depending on field size and roi so obviously roi is a little bit hard to estimate but you can ballpark it and then field size is uh, obviously a given uh and that yeah like that, that hel helps you, for example, with deciding how much action to sell and how much of yourself you should take and like what kind of tournaments you should fire and what tournaments are better to skip for optimal bankroll growth. And this is something that I never really got into, but I, I definitely focused a lot more on recently and, and it kind of opened my eyes on, on like, you know, like there's no reason to not fire more bullets in, in like 10K, 75K, whatever, because if you're rolled for it, like why wouldn't you do it? It, it should be optimal for, for bankroll growth in the long run. And you know that's that's basically your goal, right? So um, that that's something that that helped my risk tolerance in that regard because I used to feel like if I lost fifty k on a Sunday or something, I would feel sometimes pretty bad. Like you know, it is a lot of money, but that's not the way you should look at it. You shouldn't think about like, okay, I could have bought X or or, or Y from this. Uh, you should just think about like, okay, I made a good investment. This time it didn't pay out, but you know, like in the long run, this is optimal to keep firing this big and being aware of that definitely helps i think with the money side of risk tolerance like general risk tolerance in game or something that's i'm not sure how how people can improve on that uh, yeah it's not something that i maybe necessarily need to improve on I, i'm not sure like maybe but uh, that's not not something i'm working on currently but like money wise for sure 
Um, yeah, I like that. It was almost like a investor's mindset where you're trying to come with the optimal kind of betting frequency or betting kind of bets to put in in terms of buy-ins in order to get the maximum return in terms of bankroll growth. And when you can like be like that objective and almost just break poker down into those variables, this is my ROI, this is the field size, this is the value of the tournament. It becomes almost like a, you can detach the emotion side. It's like, I should play these tournaments because these are the, the most valuable. Now, obviously there's an emotional side that can make that challenging to execute that strategy. Like every investor in the world probably struggles with some degree to uh, execute on the strategy they should be doing when emotions get involved sometimes. But for you, it doesn't seem like that's an issue. Once you know what you should be doing, you can execute at a high level. Yeah. I always yeah. find it interesting when, sorry, go. No, no, yeah, it, like knowing, knowing that it's optimal kind of takes the uncertainty out of it. Um, yeah, you could still obviously be overestimating your ROI or something like this, but like given the information I have, like if 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 I think this is the optimal approach, then I feel a lot better about. I mean, I don't really care anymore about losing X amount of money because I know like I put my money in good, you know, and, and the rest is up to variance, and at some point it will pay off. Uh, and and knowing that gives you certain peace of mind. Uh, yeah, in terms of risk taking, I think. Yeah, I think that's huge, actually. I haven't heard many players speak that holistically about like kind of zooming out that far and kind of think about all the tournaments they play in in terms of kind of the expected returns on them and then getting a good strategy for maybe weeks and even maybe a whole series that comes up and what the kind of tournaments you should play. So you know your risk, kind of how much you're risking, how much the return should be, and basically where you stand before you go in. And then you go and go, right, well, this is the investment I'm going to make. There's risks involved. Let's go. That's actually my strategy. If you obviously make a lot more mistakes than you planned, then maybe your ROI was lower. But in general, like you said, you could ballpark your ROI with some sort of brackets around it to uh, get some kind of boundaries. But I think that's a big part of be able to tolerate risk because then it, the the numbers are clear before you bega began. I think a lot of people will put themselves in unnecessary situa situations. So for example, I could be waiting with somebody who's going to a series and he's, he's nervous already that the series plays a lot higher. But he's been playing bigger buy-ins and he's already worried like, oh, if I go on a bad run and I lose like 10K, 20K in my role, this is really going to hurt me right now. So he's not really sure of his risk tolerance. He doesn't really want to go on a downswing right now. He thinks the upsides could be big, but he hasn't stopped to think what's the kind of trade-offs of this, this role. And therefore it all becomes all messy. And then all of a sudden, it's just money flying around everywhere. He's like, he comes out the end of it going, God, I feel, yeah, almost like I got dragged around a bit. But your approach would, yeah, help mitigate a lot of those. And, and I think in that regard, like to uh, what you mentioned, like so, uh, I think tournament players are not always very good at like game selection. So, like, for example, if like playing huge fields with relatively low ROI is very bad for bankroll growth. Like, uh, you just need a huge bankroll to be able to play these games, like theoretically. And I think people love big fields right they really love having like these huge prizes up top but this is not necessarily optimal very often i think it's uh, very often it's, it's a lot better to play small fields for bigger buy-ins and um, i think that's something that i didn't realize often enough um you know before pretty recently and uh, I, yeah i got educated by, uh, by others on that a little bit and i think uh, that's if you if that's not something as a especially as a tournament player that you think have thought about then it's sh it should definitely be something that you should look, in, look into like try to optimize optimize what what games you play and, and try to size your bets correctly so and, and then i mean by bets i mean if you have sell action for example make sure that you keep the right amount of action don't sell too much i i've definitely sold too much in the past where i could have kept way more of my action uh because i just didn't really think of it i just sold whatever i thought felt felt comfortable with right like the action that, that uh, we keep but it's way better to approach it from a more um, scientific point of view i think and just really try to size your bets correctly okay i, I according to my bankroll my roi and the field size i should sell this so that's what i'm selling for optimal bankroll growth and uh yeah that's that's something uh, that took me a long time i guess to uh, to get into but uh, it's it's definitely um worth a lot i think in the long run yeah, I speak to a lot of MTT players and I definitely don't hear them speak this way very often in terms of thinking like the large fields being obviously the higher variance and potentially selling more action on those. And I think you mentioned the, the, the small fields are kind of the way, small fields, higher buy-ins should be where you're steering towards. And I think a lot of players would be the opposite. They're like, oh, well, the big fields, that's where they get the highest ROI. That's where it's the softest. Yeah, it, 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 like usually uh, field, field size and ROI are usually correlated. Like obviously you get you get higher ROI in, in, in very big fields, but uh, the variance is just so big because all the money is going to be on top and you're just not going to end up on top very often uh so yeah that, that's something that i think the human brain is just not very good at they, oh, people just always are attracted to big prizes and not 
really thinking about probabilities or or a lo like long term bankroll growth. So yeah, if you didn't look into that, like it took me ten years or something or or more to uh, to be able to uh, to actually grasp that and or, or like it never really interested me, I guess. Um, but yeah, now now that I uh, I know about this kind of approach, it's um, it definitely helps me. I, I think and it it should help everyone. I think. Yeah, I think players watching this, especially the MTT guys, which would be a lot of them, can probably stop and go, right, it's actually how my approach and my bankroll growth. Because I love, like, just when you gamify stuff, when you make it a game and you know the rules of the game and you're trying to get a clear outcome. So bankroll is like, okay, grow the bankroll in the best way possible. What is my way to do that? You've only got a certain number of bets, as you said. How do I optimize the, these bets to uh, to grow my bankroll in the best way with the lowest variance and the, yeah, where I'm taking the most risk on? So uh, once you get those clear, you have a strategy that you're executing on there and it just takes away a lot of the kind of yeah, unknowns and uncertainty that you mentioned, which allows you to execute strategy, which I think in life in general is just a great a great thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Gamify is, is a very good uh, approach. It works for me at least, yeah. 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 yeah, I watched a podcast recently by Jocko Willick, who's like an Navy SEAL, and it was about gamifying your life and basically making all the kind of things you're pursuing in life into a game. Really interesting, but yeah, it kind of talks about like your career should be a game, your finances a game, your health a game. And basically we're playing these games of trying to get better at something, trying to achieve an outcome. And the more we can gamify it and make it like clear rules, clear objectives, clear metrics, clear strategies I'm executing on, we're quite good at it's, it's keeping to it and, and, and executing. But very often we're on the field of a game and we don't know the rules. We're playing the health game, but everyone's like, no one's like optimizing. We're playing the financial game, but people are just like, oh, well, how do I play this one? So uh, we end up in all these like kind of games that we, we're for, not forced to play, but we play just because kind of society involves us in them and then we play the ultimate game like you know the supreme game he calls it which is to be happy to have a good life so uh, sometimes we are too zoomed in on one game like the financial game of money 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 and we forget oh wait a second am i happy right now am i enjoying my life no oh wait a second let's let's make sure i'm optimized for the big game so uh, yeah it was a nice podcast anyone if anyone wants to check that out but yeah i think gamifying stuff and making things a fun pursuit all poker players that i've spoke to competitive like games like optimizing towards an outcome so uh make your life more towards that and i think it'll help with bankroll help with yeah a lot of things uh, i really like that approach yeah, yeah for sure yeah cool all right found a question from me kind of an open one but what is your definition of success uh, just being happy i think this this is uh yeah that's what that would be my number one metric if you're if you're happy then you're you're successful i think yeah, I love this one because I thought about this one a lot in like probably the last five years. I used to like stop and think about this question quite frequently, but come with different answers. Now it's it's always happiness. It can't be anything else. And it, every time my mind starts to make it something else, it's like happiness just wins like every time. So uh, I love it when like someone's just got a clear definition for that because it just shows, yeah, it just shows a sense of wisdom. The hard, the hard part is figuring out what exactly makes you happy. But I think if, if you keep in mind always that the goal is, is happiness, then yeah, and, and the game is to figure out what makes you happy. Uh, I guess um, that's not that's a little bit less easy to answer, but yeah, the end goal always happens. And that's how I would describe success. Yeah. yeah, less easy, but also like when it's happiness is the end goal, there's many paths, many paths to success. So like, it takes a bit of pressure off. You don't have to be the millionaire and have the amazing lifestyle. You don't have to have the everything figured out relationship wise. There's many paths to happiness. So I think there's a, and there's maybe not a definitive answer. There's not like, oh, I won the game. I'm, I'm ultimately happy. It's a, it's a moving target, so to speak. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a no start we need to have. And I think sometimes as poker players, I speak with poker players pretty much every day and very often goal oriented, achievement based, want to get somewhere. And when you get so into that kind of external pursuit, you can lose sight sometimes that happiness is the goal. You almost like you put the happiness to one side until you achieve the metric. And I think sometimes just to bring happiness back to the, the front of the equation, like, right, it's always about happiness. Let's not put happiness to one side for three years until I've made X amount of money. Let's keep happiness at the forefront and then let's go through the, the, the journey with that way. I think, listen to your story throughout this conversation, we can definitely see that happiness and having a good life and enjoying your life has been a, a massive part of your progression as well. So it's been a, something you've lived by as well. For sure, yeah. Cool. All right, awesome. So we're reaching close to three hour mark. Rene, how about yourself? Any further questions you want to ask? You know, it's interesting with this happy thing because often like we are happiest when we're on the pursuit of something that forces us to develop. So that's a bit, you know, con contradicting if you're only focused on trying to pursue something, but at the same time, the pursuit is often what gives us a certain amount of happiness. You see my point there? That's the, the classic thing of like reaching your goal and then you like fall into this black hole of, you know, oh, I've reached it. And now I thought this would be the holy grail. And it turns out actually it was just the the process of getting there that gave me enjoyment and now I, I reach it and I don't know what to do anymore. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, but luckily in poker, you're 
you're never done uh, with with goals, I guess. Or I mean, it's I, I don't I don't see this happening anytime soon. So uh, yeah, the, the the road to to the Holy Grail is so long that uh, it will never end. Uh, so I don't see this uh, this pitfall for me anytime soon. But uh, yeah, it's something that some people struggle with. I think. I mean, yeah, it's it's not like for example, let's say you put a certain monetary goal. So let's say you retire from poker, and then what? Like if 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 you're not gonna do anything that that you know stimulates you intellectually, or you know in poker you feel good because it's something that you enjoy, it's something that you're good at, then you know sometimes players go back to playing poker just because of you know the way it makes them feel. It makes them feel happy. Yeah, uh, mm. yeah. I mean uh, that's that's a, a, a question that I have to answer at some point. Like because obviously it's unlikely I think that will play play poker professionally for the rest of my life. Uh, so at some point I'm gonna have to answer the question of like what am I gonna do with my life after poker but I, i'm also very confident in like being able to figure it out then and i think there's always uh, there always stuff comes on your path and you know like yeah, yeah exactly when something else comes to replace poker like something that you feel intellectually challenged at you yeah. know where every day you stand up you feel like you're you're developing as a person you're being challenged that's when you feel most happy now obviously you know you shouldn't get completely absorbed by that as we talked about many times in this podcast there's other things that give you a certain amount of joy as well and happiness, but that should be part of it. If you take that away, like nobody wants to be on in a yeah, on a holiday. For example, a holiday sometimes sounds cool. Oh, you know, I'm on the Bahamas, white beach, coconuts, and after a week, it's boring. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. you know, or at least you know, people that are often in the poker world, you know, we're wired in a certain way that after a week, everyone is like, okay, get me out of this beach. I want, I want, I want to go do something. It's usually the hype. The hype leading up to it is 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 sometimes more fun uh, and this is with, with some holidays this is the case like you you you're thinking about this this trip that you're going to make for months and then you're actually on the beach and you're like uh, after a few days you're like okay yeah, i mean you know i i would love to get back sit in my office and grind it out or whatever or like study or whatever you do in life you know it, it this yeah it's a uh, it's very uh, recognizable what you described i think yeah so that's the thing right don't fall for the trap because that's what you mentioned you work so long towards a goal and then you expect that goal to make you feel happy. That's kind of the trap, right? The happiness is in, in the process. So if you don't don't put too much too much emphasis on the end goal and then I will feel a certain way because then it will always lead to yeah, exactly. lead, lead to being disappointment. Yeah, exactly. Um I have a last question for you, which would be what would you like the main takeaway to be from this conversation for our audience listening? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess we just kind of summarized it. Uh, that's that's what I would say. And don't play 10Ks on GG. <laughs> no, but seriously, like just just uh, try to enjoy your day to day the, the day to day stuff that you do. And if you if you don't do have that currently, uh, try to really reevaluate that. And um, yeah, and I, I guess poker wise, I mean, we we've, we've walked through the whole uh, through everything, I guess. But yes. Yeah, uh, if you're trying to improve in, uh, on poker, like study the right things, study or make sure that you study methods are right, and uh, and make sure that you enjoy it. And then I think for basically everyone, it should you should be able to achieve uh, achieve a lot in poker. It's it's just a lot about having the right methods and then putting their work in. And I think most people uh, could achieve uh, almost anything in poker. Then. Yeah, and consistently show up. I remember that one. That one was very yeah, important. Part of, part of the work ethic. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, any final words you would like to share before we closing this up, Jans? Um, no, I mean, uh, I, I enjoyed this. It was, uh, it was fun. And uh, thank you for having me on. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, after my next uh, try and uh, when I can be back. <laughs> nice. Okay, we'll, 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 take, we'll take you up on that. I'll, I'll probably skip uh, the one in uh, Cyprus, though. though. So it's, it's uh, going to be the end of the year. So maybe then we'll have some actually something to talk about. Because I think if I would go to Cyprus, ship, ship an attorney and show up again on the podcast, then uh, it wouldn't be... Uh, be yeah, we'll, there, there will be less to cover. Why, why, why did you decide not to go? I would like usually. Uh, I can. Well, I you know, you're you're that, in the winning mood. You're like ah, Cyprus is yeah, on the corner. I, I haven't 100 percent decided, but um, uh, that's going to be scoop for sure. Uh, they didn't release the schedule, so I'm not sure what it will look like. But GG usually also runs something, so the EV of online is might even be higher. And then uh, I already booked Vegas for six weeks, so I think. Uh, if I tell my girlfriend that I'm going to go for two weeks to, to Cyprus and then right after six weeks to Vegas, uh, 
she'll she'll put me in the street. So uh, I have some some other stuff to consider as well. But uh, yeah, and and there's only so much live poker seriously that I can take in a year. Um, even though Triton is very enjoyable, like if if I have to, right after I have to go to Vegas for six weeks. Um, yeah. Uh, and then I guess also going from the Triton treatment to the World Series treatment. That's yeah, yeah you're, you're setting yourself up to be uh, frustrated. Oh, I Triton, everything is better. Yeah, no, that's that's why I also uh, I really I'm gonna try to be very very selective in Vegas, like not play any like. You know, it might be a little bit, uh, yeah, I might be tempted to play like a random 2K or 1K or something like this. And I'm really going to try to stay away from that because it's not as enjoyable of an experience. And then if you play a lot of these tournaments in, in this period, you're going to probably burn out because it's just, if you do something that you don't really enjoy, yeah, there's not, there's only so much you can take from that. So, um, yeah, I'm going to try to be really selective, travel around a little bit, like maybe CLA, San Francisco, Grand Canyon, whatever. Uh, and uh, and mix it up a little bit and not play that much poker over, over the six weeks. So, um, but yeah, like you said, if you go from Tribe to Vegas, it's a it's a bit bit of a drop off. So that that would also not work out too well, I think. All right. Well, then I want to wish you best of luck in Vegas. Thank you so much, um, and uh, have a good one, guys. Thank you a lot, Jans, for coming on and sharing a bunch of wisdom on the pot. Let's go over some main takeaways. We already heard Jans's main takeaway, Adam. What's your main takeaway from this podcast? It was a really fun conversation. And I think, yeah, hopefully the audience learned a lot. Myself, I found lots of things interesting. What the first one I wrote down was the identity switch that he made when he decided to become pro. And this was very interesting because he'd already binked the Sunday million and won a 200k score. He then had like five years of kind of, let's say, plodding along a little bit, grinding, but also going to university without like taking poker too seriously. And then there's a very definitive moment where he said, I'm going pro. And I really think that we can always, in any moment we can decide, I'm taking this seriously now. I'm stepping into a new version of myself. And from that moment, he changed his approach. He became a professional version of himself almost overnight. And I think it's really interesting how powerful that, that is and how often we can use this if we needed to. So uh, anytime you're struggling to make change in your life, you can create a new identity and step into that almost like, instantaneously if you really wanted to so uh, found that interesting next one was using competition as fuel i think going into this conversation it was funny that he initially turned down this, the invite because he didn't really get wasn't into mindset um so i was interested to know how that was going to unravel in terms of the, the kind of the, the stories he was telling and yeah one of the things i found very interesting was the using competition as fuel and when he's losing things aren't going well he gets over quite quickly i think he, might, he said he shakes it off and doesn't have much of a, 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 a kind of lingering effect but then he uses that his fuel to study harder and to crush the guys the next day. So uh, this allows him to play high volume, not get too down on himself, to uh, yeah, basically not have too much kind of turbulence around bad results, which is yeah, really, really uh, big superpower. And then he mentioned a lot throughout the conversation, I think, was work ethic and consistency, consistency in particular. And obviously, he's just won a big, big score. The Triton recently, and it's very easy from the outside to go, oh, wow, amazing. Like, look at you winning like million dollar scores. Really good. But at the same time, like he's wait, he's been patient. Like he's been in these games over and over. He even mentioned, like, probably until the Triton, which is literally 15 years into his career, he's probably been running bad at high stakes. Like, and he's still like showing up and over and over. So uh, to not be demoralized, to continually be there showing up. Some of the factors that he contributed to that were the fact that he enjoys the game so much. He's always trying to get better. He's got a competitive drive. But yeah, I think that we can't underestimate how important it is to be consistent. And sometimes consistency means you show up for 15 years until you get that big bink. So yeah, they're the main ones that uh, kids are for me. How about yourself, Renee? Yeah, an important one there was as well the, the closing loops part. So for example, he didn't bring any negativity from a previous session next to the next session because all the spots that he was uncertain of, he would try to review. And then basically he would learn from them and get motivated by them. Or let's say, for example, he was a bit tilted. He would give himself some room to feel sad about it or angry about it and then it was just done and that i think helped him every time put in the volume every time right because the tilt doesn't really accumulate uh he actually all the way in the beginning when he was talking i think i asked him like if you had them how was it and how, how did you do it he said win flips easy takeaway right there for the mtt players out there um in terms of technical i think we had a couple of very good points uh in general people are too aggressive uh, not not aggressive enough and they fall too much. Usually actually these things go hand in hand because you fall too much because your pool is not too aggressive. And this is a trend you see apparently both in entities and in cash. The lower you go, the more passive people are and the, and 
uh, and the more full DP poor. So if you're a lower stakes player, that's usually a leak that you will have. Uh, he then also talked a lot about study, study, study. We heard the word study a lot. And he talked about, yeah, it's very important to in, invest your time in the right things. And kind of the formula came up is frequency of the spot, very important, and EV of the spot. And for frequency, I think he said that 80% of the studying is preflop, which obviously in entities is very important. If you're a cash game player, don't invest 80% of your time in preflop. Okay, I would not recommend that. And then he also talked about high EV spots. So those would be ICM spots that he mentioned. That's when that's when the money starts to really matter, right? This was kind of his study uh, study approach. And then he later also talked about heads up. Why then in this case, heads up would not fall under that. In terms of frequency spots, let's say you play uh, cash in position as an initial raiser, big blind out of position as the caller, single raise spots. Those are going to be like the most frequent situations that you're going to be in. Obviously, preflop will be most uh, frequent. So make sure to uh, nail those. Not too easy to fix in terms of like coming up with a static strategy. Obviously, to then be more more flexible and adjust where possible, that requires a little bit more of experience. But frequency of spots, play in, in position as an initial raiser, play big blind out position as the caller. Okay, this is just going to be the most frequent spots that you should start nailing down. Uh, a last point that we also made in terms of solvers, uh, a lot of players might use a solver because they want to look up if they played the hand correct. And he clearly was talking more about using solvers to develop solid strategies so that you never fall under a certain baseline, right? To generate a solid C game. I think this is a very important uh, uh, takeaway of how you can use solvers in a more efficient way. All right. I mean, I'm sure there was many, many more goodness, but you know, we have to sum up a couple of points. Re-listen to the pot if you want to go through it all. Actually, I hear sometimes people listen to pods multiple times. Uh, shout out to you guys because they're quite long. Uh, I mean, people have a lot of wisdom to share, so it would be a waste to only talk to them for an hour, in my opinion. And if you're still listening to this right now, me rambling, you agree on this point. <laughs> All right. I'm going to now close it off because it's getting way too long. I want to thank Adam and I want to thank Jans, of course, for coming on. Remember, leave a like and your main comments, your main takeaway comments down below. And you get a chance to win uh, one month free on GTO Wizard. We will pick between the comments down below who share their main takeaways. We will pick one and he will get a free one month of GTO Wizard. So make sure to do that. And I will see you guys in the next podcast episode. <laughs>